Okay, we're going to get started. Can everybody online hear me? Yes. Okay. And welcome everybody. This is our second class and we're glad you're here in this nice foggy weather. Uh, just a couple updates. We now have 30 trainees in the class and I want you all to watch your uh, email for updates on field trips, etc. And um, those are being put together. And I know Robert sent some of them out today, uh, but that's that's the way we communicate. And also, if you want, if if you use social media, then join our Facebook page because there was a lot of announcements that get posted there too. Um, I just wanted to let you know that several of our trainees work for our partners, so. For instance, Sea Turtle, Coastal Studies Lab, Arroyo Colorado Audubon, Palo Alto National Battlefield, and SPI Birding Nature and Alligator Sanctuary. So make sure you guys all let your, your classmates know about opportunities with your organizations if you have volunteer needs or things like that, because this group needs volunteer hours. So you've got to ready group to hopefully volunteer for you. Uh, the latest info on the VMS entries was sent today. You guys are doing really good. At least a, there were a third of you that had entered last week's class. That's really very good. So you're doing a good job. If you get a, memo, a, a message back that says that you need to tweak it a little bit more, like for instance, saying it was very interesting class doesn't fly with the state. You've got to put who the speaker was and and what the topic was. Barry Goldsmith talking about weather of the RGB, you know. So um, that, uh, but you're you're still doing a great job because most people by this first class hadn't even logged on to the system. So. Um, but we'll be updating every week. You'll know where you stand and your mentors will know where you stand. So um, I'm sure they'll, they'll be happy to know that you're right on top of things. Uh, as far as I said, we sent the first group of, group of field trips out and note the starting times on those, like uh, be prompt because like the ones that are, most of them are not put on by us and the, presenter will drive off in the tram or whatever at the, at the assigned time. So leave enough time to travel to the place. Uh, we sent out information about a position that we have, which is the new class representative to the board. And we had a volunteer. And I'd like Robert Cepeda to stand up. So Robert Tepeda was kind enough to volunteer for this position. And what he'll do is he'll go to every board meeting and on your behalf, he will listen to the board and bring back information to you that is relevant to the new class. And also he will share with the board what you guys are doing or any concerns you have. So you'll, that's your, your mouthpiece. So, and, and your ear, bend his ear. So, um, one last thing, next week's speakers, Dr. Jude, Jude Benavides from, from, uh, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, uh, earth environmental and marine sciences. He's going to focus on hydrology and water resources of the RGV. And then Augusto Sanchez Gonzalez is the director of Estuary Environmental and Special Projects for Cameron County. He'll be talking about sustainable building and water conservation. So um, he's, both are very interesting. Dr. Benavides gives you the whole history of all the Resaca systems. And Augusto talks about different ways that even that they're, they're utilizing in Brownsville. And here, even at this uh, facility, the parking lot, the water drains through it, et cetera. So I'll, I won't give his presentation. I'll wait and let him do it. Um, but they're both very interesting speakers, as is 
theory, which everyone always finds his presentation on the weather fascinating. And we just happened to have you right after <laughs> one of the freeze events, which was not nearly as bad as 2021. But Barry is uh, the warning coordination meteorologist with NOAA, the National Weather Service in Brownsville and the Rio Grande Valley. And he's a 38 year veteran of the agency. And he's been um, in my neck of the woods. He was in Washington DC for a while and that's, I'm from near there. And so we both made it down to the Rio Grande Valley and I'll let you take it away. All right, so uh, good evening, everybody. I don't recognize too many faces except the ones I've known from the past year. So I guess all of you are new, which is good because a lot of this presentation is similar to years past. I try to update um, with some new information from the previous year um, in terms of weather and climate. So I've got some of that in there, uh, but the rest of it is, is kind of, I don't say boilerplate, but it all fits in with you know the climate of the valley, um, how it's generally been, although we are seeing changes, and we'll try to talk about that. So this is pretty much all you need to know um, about the state of Texas. I could quit right now, and I think we'd be done. Um, we're seeing this right now. We, we had drought across a good part of central Texas. We still do but we just had 10 to 14 inches of rain fall over that. And that's caused some flooding. It's not catastrophic in this case, but it's flooding. And within a few months, we're likely to go back into drought. So that's just the, the nature of the state overall. This was said back in the 1920s. We've been seeing this drought to flood to drought to flood for several years now. And it wasn't always that way. So let's go through it real quick. You have June 2018 on the upper left. This is uh, taken, I think, between Brownsville and San Benito. And then just a few weeks later, we had a flood in Brownsville and other parts of the valley, by the way. And then clockwise, or on the bottom right, it got dry again. And then the left side, it got nice and green. We had a lot of rainfall. And so it didn't stop there. 2019, the June flood hit Raymondville, Sebastian, all the way over to um, uh, Santa Rosa, Hidalgo County, La Feria. Didn't get too much of the lower valley, but it did rain hard here. We had some minor flooding. And then um, if you go to the right there, March 2020, it's bone dry again. And, and then July 2020, lower left, that's Hurricane Hannah. So we're wet. March 2021, we're bone dry again. And then we had a flood on October 2nd, 2021 in Brownsville. And that road in East Brownsville was under three, four feet of water. It was not a Rosaka, it was just a drainage canal. And then to drought again um, in 2022 and even into early 2023. And not shown here is the summer and early fall of 2023, which we'll talk a little bit about shortly. So it just doesn't stop. The cycle continues, but we're seeing the droughts are longer and worse. We'll explain why a little bit. So sort of geography of the valley, it's a river delta and a coastal desert. So we're not really a valley, but that's been a long-term name here and we all use it, we all love it. We even wrote a song about it. Anybody in Rotary Club? Any Rotarians would know the, the, the Rio, Grande valley, Rio Grande Valley song. Um, to say this valley down by the Rio Grande, it's pretty nice, pretty fun. I can't recite it. So if someone knows it, that's great. Um, drainage basin of the Rio Grande below Falcon Reservoir. There's little elevation change from the reservoir to the Gulf, sea level to near 900 feet from east to west. Jim Hall County is some of the highest terrain, but again, it's all low compared to other parts of the state and the country. And the curvature of the Texas coast creates some microclimate convergent zones, which helps to create things like sea breezes. The Mexican plateau contributes to the desert climate here. It's tropical desert. Winds downslope to Sierra Madre create drier air and it's hard to make rain out of drier air atmospherically. It may be hot and humid at the surface, but upstairs, a lot of the time it's not. It's pretty dry, and so we don't get a lot of rain, which is why you see the uh, Texas climate map here. These are the rainfall averages um, back from 1971 to 2000. And despite the fact that we're in a changing climate, rainfall averages across the state haven't changed all that much as the temperature averages have changed more. But a lot of people like to say Texas is its own republic. I mean, people know that, its own nation. And if you look at our climate and our weather 
In our rainfall, we have all the climate regimes, if you think about it. We are desert in El Paso, and we are kind of semi-rainforest over near Beaumont Part Arthur, looking at those rainfall amounts, over 54 inches a year. And here in the valley, I don't know if I have a laser pointer. I think I do. Won't work on that, though. Never mind. Um, here in the valley, you're looking at rainfall that averages between 14 and 22 inches from west to east. And I'll show you what that looks like in the climate curves or climate types. These are the Köppen climate types. And you can see Texas has a bunch of them dominated by the humid subtropical CFB, uh, CFA, um, which is that light green color. And that extends pretty much from I-35, a little bit west of there, all the way down to Interstate 69C here in the Mid-Valley. But notice if you get to the Upper Valley, which is in the left side of that black shaded area or black outlined area, we are in a hot semi-arid climate. That's called BSH. And so we have split climate regimes here in the lower Rio Grande Valley, which is uh, what makes the plant life and even the wildlife uh, somewhat interesting when you go from over here all the way out to Starr County, about 130 miles away. So the general climate of the valley, um, the lower valley actually is lowercase l because in terms of the state and in terms of the, the Rio Grande itself, the whole region down here is known as the capital lower Rio Grande Valley. The middle valley is up getting towards El Paso and um, the Big Bend region and the upper valley is actually New Mexico, Colorado. That's the big uppercase version. But down here we know the lowercase l as Cameron, Hidalgo, Cameron Willacy County, the middle valley is like Hidalgo County and the Star County would be the upper valley. So down here we are in the humid subtropical, uh, but as you get farther west into the quote upper valley, we are in the semi-arid. Terrain exerts very little influence. It does not impede the passage of transient systems from west to northwest, although the mountains do some things to it um, to change the way the weather ends up being, particularly in the winter and the spring. The Laguna Madre and Gulf of Mexico do moderate the local weather, producing a pronounced sea breeze effect in the summer, <clears throat> and I say somewhat modifying polar outbreaks in the winter. Um, anybody from Florida here? Anybody spend any time living in Florida here? I was one, two, maybe three. I was, have spent nine years in Tampa Bay. And one thing about Florida is it's a true peninsula. And therefore, uh, there is modification from cold fronts that come down by either the Gulf or the Atlantic Ocean, unless you can get a wind straight down the peninsula when it gets cold all around there. Here, we're like a one-sided peninsula. Just to your east, you have the Gulf. But to your west, you don't have anything but dryness and land. And so if an air mass is going to be a freight train of cold air coming down the east side of the Rocky Mountains, hint, hint, last week, it's not going to warm up that much. It will only warm up because of the sun angle and the latitude, but the actual quality of the air mass will still hold its Arctic air, and that's why it's modified versus completely changed by water. So we can see those outbreaks when the depth of the cold air mass is sufficient to move fronts deep into Mexico. Um, that depth means that the atmosphere is bringing in very, very cold air from the pole all the way into the Great Plains. Then ultimately, the shift of the weather pattern in terms of the steering flow kind of goes from northwest to southeast into the Ohio Valley, Mississippi Valley, Tennessee Valley. And we don't see that, but cold air is, is going to sink to the surface because it's what? Heavy. So when it sinks to the surface, it becomes shallow and dense, and it just bullies the warm air out of the way when it comes in the form of the front. And we saw that last Monday. Um, and we didn't forecast that very well, though we should have, because we know the nature of the shallow cold air. The freeze came one day early, and some of our models, although late to the party, were indicating that it would start to come on Monday. We held back a bit. I'm not sure why. Uh, but we do learn lessons from things like that. And again, the cold air is a freight train, especially near the ground, because it sinks there and it just bullies the warm air out of the way, just shoves it. So again, no established delineation of the seasons here. It's not like the four seasons where you have the um, Julian calendar, you know, the solstice and the equinoxes. But I like to say there are seasons here. There's warm, hot, hotter, and hell. <laughs> So uh, this is the average rainfall for Brownsville. And I could have shown another site, but since we are nearest Brownsville, this is the lower valley, it's the most appropriate location. 
And you can see how dry we generally are. We have a dry winter. We have a modestly dry spring. We have a pretty dry autumn. And then you have the mountain of rain. I like to call it a mountain because it looks like it's a hill there in September. Anybody know why we have a mountain of rain in September? It's more than you think. Anyone want to answer that question? Why is there more rain in September? In fact, it's more than double what we get in August. Why is that? There's one obvious reason. What was that? School starts, got it. <laughs> the school starts in August, and it's not that wet yet. Hurricanes, hurricane peak of the hurricane season, that is one reason. But we don't get a hurricane or a tropical cyclone, meaning a storm, depression, or hurricane every year, do we? It can take five, 10 years before we get hit. In fact, the return frequency is about, about 13 years for a direct hit, even actually 40 years in some cases for a direct hit. So what else might be causing it? You might not know the answer to this one. So it's the atmospheric pattern that tends to set up because of the way the oceans warm later than the calendar says, right? The sun angle is peaking when? June 21st, solstice. But the warmest waters in the Atlantic basin, meaning the Atlantic, Gulf, Caribbean, are when? Late August and September. And so that dictates how the atmospheric ridges of high pressure move across those areas. There's something called a Bermuda Ridge that forms over those warm waters. And on the south side of that Bermuda Ridge, is flow over where? The Southern Gulf, Bay of Campeche, Caribbean Sea, Southwestern Atlantic Ocean, and it's laden with tropical layer. And that's the dominant flow in September. And guess what that means? Lots of atmospheric moisture, which produces the rain that we typically would see in September, kind of stretching into early October on average. And then the first cold fronts arrive, and that brings dry air in the atmosphere and near the ground, and that's the end of it. You can see it cuts off sharply in November. So that's our mountain of rain. So let's start to talk about temperatures now. Um, there's averages on here, and then there's also what happened in 2023. So these are actually the observed values in 2023 in terms of high and low temperature, superimposed over where the averages would be. Um, the red spikes at the top are your record high temperatures, and your blue spikes at the bottom are your record low temperature. What's the first thing you notice about 2023? And of course, the answer is at the bottom. But what's the first thing you notice on the chart regarding the reds and the blue spikes? Is anything close to the blue spike? These are daily high and low temperatures. Do you see any trend that's close to the blue spikes? That's a yes or no answer. No, whoever said no, that's it, right? Everything's above the blue spikes. It's a few get near, most are below. What about the red spikes? Any temperatures near the red spikes? Are some of them on the red spikes? So look what happened. Last summer, we had a whole bunch of record temperatures. Not necessarily the highest temperatures on record, but the averages were way up there. So where you see that red outlined area, there's very few low temperatures that are even on the average. They're all above the average. And you can see that most of the uh, blue line, the, the, the blue area, that darker blue going to the red spike, it's actually hitting that. So in the end, that was a record hot summer. And it went all the way into early October. And then you get to autumn, you can see the ups and downs, right? Over to the right side of the screen, you're getting some that get into the blue, not to the spike, but to the blue, and others to the red. So that means more closer to average. But if you look at mild winter and spring, the January through March period was actually pretty warm, too. And when you added it all up, 2023 ranked warmest on record, not only for Brownsville, but for most of the Rio Grande Valley. So how about rainfall? This was really interesting. Remember drought to flood to drought to flood? Well, in spring, we had some minor flooding, but not a lot. The rain was actually very welcome. But it ended up being the ninth wettest astronomical spring on record. And that was between March 21st and June 22nd. But then right after that, we flipped the switch. And we had the third driest astronomical summer. That makes sense, right? Because we had a record hot summer. So when it's hot, it's going to tend to be dry because the rain tends to cool things down a little bit towards average. It never happened. And then um, in the fall, we had cooling, but not cool. It was still, on average, a little bit above 
then we had this rainfall in Veterans Day. You can see the green line kind of go up sharply. That was a four-day event of rain that was between three and nine inches across, three and seven inches across the, the valley, um, which is well above average for November, as you saw in the last slide. You can see the, the gradual rise in accumulation. That's the green, the green uh, line here in that ninth wettest astronomical spring, a nice steady rise from late March through early June. And then you see almost no rise through the summer. That was the cutoff, end of the rain. So these lines are maybe a little hard to read, but you kind of get the idea. The averages are in the uh, brown color. That's what normal would be. And then the wettest versions of the years are in the uh, highest numbers, of course, are in the uh, dark blue color there. And the lowest are in the red. So once you've accumulated, it's hard to go back to the lowest. But it's interesting that you look at the summer values after that nice wet spring. And we got a little closer until that November rain, the reds were creeping up, or should I say the greens were not moving much. And we were getting closer to a dry year. And so we'll show you that next. Um, that Brownsville had, let's see if it's on the slide. It's not going back, let me go back, back, back. Uh, let's see, yeah, 22.23 inches, the 45th driest on record, four inches below average. So we were getting close, then November happened. I can tell you if November's rain didn't happen, we would have been top 15 driest. And going back to 1878, that's out of 145 years of record. That's pretty high. And so in the end, it was the top third of the driest years, which makes sense when you have a record hot year. You're going to end up being on the dry side. So this is a slide I want to really focus on a bit before we move on. Um, nine of the warmest years occurred since 2011. This is for Brownsville, but this also matches up closely with Harlingen and McAllen. And even a few other sites are within that more than five of 10 years occurring since 2011. What's interesting at Brownsville is all nine the top nine all happened since 2011. Notice when these records started, 1878, not 1978. Um, so 2022 and 2021 started on the cool side, but ended up on the warm side. And guess what's happening this year, right? We had a freeze, a pretty good freeze with three cold days. Guess where January is ending up with these warm days around it? A little bit below average maybe. And our forecast coming up, which we'll tell you later, is showing indications that we're gonna rank again when we get done with 2024. What's concerning to me is this is the 1980 to 2023 values. You can see that the, um, in, the, in the chart, the red line or brownish red line shows the average temperature. This is day and night temperature combined. has gone up from roughly 73 and a half to 76. No, more than that, hang on, 70, uh, 77 roughly. Now you think that's not a lot, four degrees, but over the course of years, when you average all the days together, four degrees in 30, uh, 43 years is quite the rise. We've heard about this 1.5 degree centigrade deal, right, where you have to lower the rises in the industrial age. Well, four degrees centigrade, in this case, or Celsius, which is roughly the number here, um, is about 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit, I think two even, or 1.9 degrees uh, Celsius. So we're above the 1.5, and there's no slowing down. If you take the red outlined area, uh, that is the 2011 to 2023, and this curve in green is called the lowest curve. It kind of shows the statistical averages over different segments, or five-year or 10-year segments, and you can see that there's a accelerated rise in temperature. So while from 1980 on, we've gone up roughly 1.9 degrees centigrade-ish. The lowest curve since 2011 kind of indicates more like a 2.5 degrees centigrade rise. Um, and 2023 just broke a brand new record. And we're like, wow, how can we keep breaking records? But we are doing it. So I'll leave that to your um, mindset here. So before I go to the events, any questions before we move forward on the overall climate of the valley? That goes to the online folks. All right, we'll move on. So let's talk about weather events that kind of go into uh, the larger scale climate. As I say, weather, one of, the, one of my colleagues who's an um, esteemed professor at University of Georgia makes this statement. He says, you know, weather is your, let's see, let me see what it is. Weather is your mood, right? Your mood always changes, right? Climate's your personality. 
personality is who you are, right? So there's other ways of framing that, but a weather event does not mean that climate is not changing to some degree. It's just a feature embedded. So you can still have winter during global warming. We've seen that here. 2022 uh, still ranked, I think, in the top 10, the top 15 warmest in most of the valley. And we had a December freeze that was almost as hard as the one we just had. Um, 2021 was one of the warmest years on record. And we had the what they call the Yuri freeze in February. It lasted five days. But so many warm days were counteracting that freeze that the year overall was a much above average. So let's get to weather events. More frequent down here, you feel it every day, strong winds. Not too much right now. In fact, December and early January wasn't too windy, and then January 8th it went all crazy on us. But strong winds are very frequent. It's called the Valley Wind Machine. We'll talk about that momentarily. Heat and drought, obviously. I mean, we just talked about that at length. Flooding, we talked about that too. We'll show more data on the floods. Lightning, believe it or not, it's a frequent event, but it's not constant. So unlike Houston and the northern Gulf Coast, we don't get a lot of lightning per square mile. But when it does hit here, man, it really hits. I mean, some of the worst lightning I've ever seen in my life. And I lived in Florida for nine years on the West Coast, which is another lightning hotbed for the continuous nature through summer. But the lightning intensity here was some of the worst I've seen, probably the worst I've seen in some of the events. Less frequent, tropical cyclones. You might say, wait, we're in the hurricane zone, right? Well, we are. But an Atlantic hurricane forming off the Cabo Verde Islands off of Africa has a long way to go to get here. And typically it won't make it here. So you have to have just the right puzzle pieces to fit together in the right location geographically to get a tropical cyclone here. Um, direct hits for the lower valley. I want to say 1933, we had Labor Day storm. 1967, Beulah. 2008 Dolly. Those are the direct hits in Cameron County. And what's the distance in years? 41 years for direct hits. Now the valley is seen, what's that? Direct, those are direct hits to Cameron County um, going back going back in 90 years. Gilbert was not direct hit, hit Mexico. Now, do we have impacts with tropical storm winds and even some hurricane force winds? Absolutely. Hurricane Han, I made a direct hit on the Kennedy County coast, uh, the Padre Island National Seashore, if you've ever been up there. Didn't hit directly in the valley. It didn't hit, there's certainly got Cameron County, and yet we had hurricane force winds in some places. So it doesn't mean we didn't get some hurricane impacts. It's just a lot of people track the, track the landfall in the eye, right? The eye made landfall at. So that's not what the impacts are. But when people are going to say, how often do we get hit directly? And I'll say once every 41 years. So. Roughly. Doesn't mean we couldn't have one next year, though, right? I mean, it only takes one to break that pattern. So, freezes and cold are also a rare bird, although 2021 February, 2022 December, and 2023 January, we had some pretty decent freezes. So, it's kind of interesting that we're getting a little more frequency in recent years, but I can't make a trend for that right now. So, the Valley Wind Machine, probably the number one routine impact that people know this area for. All you have to do is look at any of the Italian cypress, Australian pines that are out there, and they're all leading to the north, right? right? That's why, uh, because it's a dominant wind. It can't stunt the growth of trees. I mean, the wind is, is persistently strong, and they're hardy trees that can make it, but other trees, that's why you see a lot of mesquite here and lower, lower topped oaks. Obviously, you have palms and whatnot, but we don't have a lot of tree growth down here. Rain is part of that factor, too, by the way. It's not just the wind. But uh, the wind can affect bird and insect movements day to day, and it can definitely alter moisture forcing mechanisms. And here's what the wind machine is. Low pressure forms east of the Sierra Madre Oriental because that's the way atmospheric dynamics work. You have wind in the atmosphere flowing down slope, um, and that creates what's called a vorticity, which is a spin or rotation, not big spin like you get in a tornado or hurricane, but enough to create lower pressure. And then you have heat, and what happens with heat? Air rises and the pressure decreases. So a little bit of vorticity, a little bit of heat low, and you've got a general low pressure there. Over to the east in the Gulf of Mexico, you have a general higher pressure where the temperature over the water is cooler than over land. So you get a little more sinking of the air, relatively speaking. Therefore, your pressure is higher. Air flows in the northern hemisphere at the surface, clockwise around high pressure. 
counterclockwise around low pressure, and in between you get a gradient flow from south to north. And that's why the trees are all leaning. <laughs> and it's a dominant flow um, February, March, April, uh, May even. And then back in the fall, you start to get it again on occasion, November into December. Now we have other wind regimes here. It's not all south to north, but if I showed you a wind rose, you would see the dominance of the south southeast wind blowing to the north northwest and that's what creates, creates it so the valley wind machine pattern can happen in all kinds of atmospheric steering flow believe it or not because there's native high pressure in the gulf and the low pressure off the sierra madre and the lee of the sierra madre are there but when you get atmospheric steering patterns such as this one with a low pressure trough in the atmosphere digging into the southwest u.s and a ridge of high pressure building into the um, eastern Gulf of Mexico over towards Bermuda. In between, you get south, southwesterly flow up at, say, 18,000, 25,000, 10,000 feet. And that enhances the strength of the surface low off the Sierra Madre. And the ridge of high pressure in the eastern Gulf strengthens the surface ridge in the eastern and central Gulf. So in between, you get even stronger winds than you would normally. And this is exactly what happened on January 8th. If you were down here in Cameron County, we had a hurricane force wind gust in Brownsville. And over here, we had 67 mile per hour wind gust just up the road at Bayview. And in Harlem, we had a gust of 55. But when you got to Wedago County, the gusts were only 35 to 40 because that gradient of wind was sharpest right here in Cameron County. But it was related to a pattern similar to this was more than the wind machine. You literally couldn't go outside without getting blown away on that day. So Valley wind machine in January, guess what? It happens in other years. So it happened this year on January 8th. It happened last year on January 24th. And we had some minor damage with it, as we did this year in Cameron County on the 8th. And so once again, there's your pattern in the atmosphere here. Low pressure in the atmosphere moving into Arizona. Um, and then they ultimately, New Mexico and West Texas, there's a ridge of high pressure. It's not as strong as the one in that other case that we had from 2008, but it's there. Uh, from Kentucky down into the Bahamas, and in between you have southwesterly flow in the atmosphere, and that strengthened the flow at the surface on that particular day. You can see the wind gusts here in Cameron County, 58 at Brownsville uh, Airport, uh, 51 over here at the Bayview Cameron County Airport, and then even in the mid valley, it gusts into the 40s. But the, the wind gusts were less as you got farther west. Um, some of the ones that show up here are not from as trusted a site as we have, so they might be lower. Um, but 62 was Harlingen, was the peak wind at Valley Airport on that day. And on January 8th, we had very similar, as I mentioned before. So, what about heat? We all know heat is a big deal here. What am I doing on time, by the way? Oh, stretch my time. Oh, perfect. 640. Yeah, a lot more to get to. I'll fly through. So evaporation rate, we have different levels of evaporation, slow, light wind, high humidity. Today's a good example of that. January, lower sun angle, not any sun. It's been raining a little bit. So you know, we do have warm weather, but it's not really creating a big heat day. Um, moderate heat days, we have higher evaporation rates, uh, moderate wind, low humidity, strong wind, and high humidity, and common in spring. And then our high evaporation rates, strong wind, low humidity, a common in fall and spring, but we had a lot of high evaporation rate last summer too, for not the strong wind as much as the low humidity, although we did have some windy days last summer as the Valley wind machine was going for different reasons. Well, how hot can it get? Uh, this was a super heat blast, June 22nd, 2017. It was caused by multiple reasons. We had ridge of high pressure in the atmosphere, which kind of the heat dome, and at the same time, we had a tropical cyclone moving into Southwest Louisiana. And that caused, caused compressional heating of air that really made it hot here. Um, these are actual temperatures, not heat index. So uh, records were set. McAllen 111, um, north of Edinburgh 111, even, even down here in Harlands 104, 105. But there's more. Um, these are uh, heat index days, feels like temperatures from the year 2019 in June. Um, you can see upper 100 teens to even 120 plus on this particular day, which is June 9th. Um, interestingly, we blew that away last year. And I'll go into that next slide. But 
Last year, we had a whole bunch of days in late June where we were hitting these numbers constantly. We're hitting 118, 120, 121, roughly from June 15th till about June 29th, 28th, almost the end of the month. And then we had periodic days in July and August, September, where we did it again. Um, we issue something called a heat advisory. How many people have heard of the term heat advisory? A few of you have seen that. We base our heat advisory on having one 11 or higher heat index for two hours or more in any given day. And we base it on statistics we derived from 1996 until 2009, which is a good sample size. Um, 13 years, we go farther back. I don't remember. It was a good sample size. And it was a very sharp cutoff at 111 where we had many fewer situations of observation that we had 111 or higher heat index. So we issued those with the idea that we'll do three to six per year, right? So people don't become, you know, numb to hearing this heat advisory deal, right? And most years it lands that way, three to six, sometimes nine, sometimes 10, sometimes none, depends on the year. Even in this warming world, we still kept that number intact until last year, 55 heat advisories last year. So, and that was for the 111 plus. Now, heat warning is even more interesting because our heat warning criteria is 116 or higher. Used to be 120. We used to want to say, it's a hot place, you know, hot, hotter, hell, right? Well, <clears throat> we had a lot of hell last summer. And the heat, we actually issued six heat warnings, and I think we verified all of them. We expect to issue one or fewer in any given summer because we just don't hit 116 very often for multiple, multiple reasons, either too dry or not as hot as it needs to be. Last year we did. And so if I took this map that's showing now and replicated, I could have replicated this kind of map on six to 10 occasions where a few pockets would have broken 116, but most areas were lower, but six occasions it was higher than 116. In some cases like 122, 123, et cetera. So needless to say it had an impact on health, the heat, uh, heat health impacts and we hear a lot of that. So the actual values of temperature, not the heat index, but the actual values of temperature lined up pretty amazingly last year too. The number of 100 degree days, you can read them here. Look at the spike at the end of this chart. Brownsville especially. Brownsville, it's really hard to get 100 here um, from Brownsville to the coast. You see many years in the past, zero, zero, zero. All those dots there, it's just some little dots. Those are zeros going back in time. You get a few years of one or two or four. Then we came last year, 30. And actually, I think our final number was 30. This was through August. So I think our final number was actually 39 or 38, um, destroying the prior record, which I think was 12. So, and the 12 was set in 2019, I think. So there's actually an upward trend in the recent decades of 100 degree days too. Um, Harlingen, 47 days, it blew away its record. I think in, in the end, it was 49. Um, I wish I had that in front of me, but this is a great chart just to show you all. Prior record was 37, so we blew that away in Harlingen, I think by 12 or more. Brownsville, you can see it. the 12 was still 12, and we had 30, I want to say 35 to 39, so it just destroyed it. And then McAllen was interesting. At the time of this chart, it was one day below the record um, for the, the June through August period of 72. In the end, the calendar year, we thought we might get to 100 days, which was never achieved before. We ended up getting 97, and we did break the record, which I think was 2009. And I want to say it was 94 or 90, it was over 90, 91, 94, something like that. So we broke the 100 degree day records everywhere last year. And you can see McAllen doesn't really have a true trend, although it did go up the last couple of years. The numbers there are kind of up and down, but overall there's been a trend since 1980 upward, but it's the Harlands and Brownsville numbers that are a little more concerning to me that we see a definitive trend in recent years. And we'll have to see where that goes from here. But if you've looked at some of the global warming um, modeling that's been done by NOAA, it does imply that those trends will continue as we move into the mid 20th, 21st century, and especially the late 21st century. So drought, evaporation rate, when it's high to extreme, we get drought. Um, we had a lot of high last year, even in spring, uh, not in spring, but even in early summer, and even in January, February, it's medium to high days. Dry ground, high sun angle, increasing wind, more dry ground, positive feedback loop. 
Summer 2009, that was a crazy year. I think I have some data that I'll show you the difference between 2009 and 10 with the drought coming up. But 2011 was a record driest water year ever in the state of Texas. Um, the difference was we had to go, we went into drought pretty rapidly because um, it was amazing how dry it was and how hot it was across the state. We lost 5 billion in agriculture in the state. We also lost 4 billion to wildfire damage um, and, and destruction in 2011. A lot of wildfires are human caused though. So we obviously need to know what to do there. Continuing into mid-2013, that was a pretty prolonged event, but the 2011 really set the tone. Uh, 2023, last year, we had the drought through early March. We broke it with near record rainfall in the spring, the Julian spring. Um, and then again, we started drought in mid-June or, dry, or dryness. And then by July, we were back in drought, continued through early October. We had a big rain event October 5th and more rain gradually with the culmination in November that finally wiped it out. 2024, early prognosis, unfortunately, is for a return of drought by spring and probably by summer. So <clears throat> this was last year um, where we were in January. We're much better now. Uh, we have no drought. We have some dryness in Zapata County, but last year we had drought. So tropical desert, erratic rainfall is normal. La Nina years tend to be drier, but there's no guarantee that an El Nino year will be wetter, although this year is doing nicely. But we're having these weird episodes, like November was great. We had an El Nino event, and that gave us so much more rainfall that the, the period will end up above, but December was dry. And January has been a mixed bag, and we had some rain over here in Cameron County, but farther west there hasn't been much. And we'll see what February brings, but our trend is going to go drier. So. Again, detrimental to Atlantic hurricanes in an El Nino year, but again, it only takes one to be a story. We'll talk a little bit about hurricanes later. <clears throat> so we're not in a La Nina, we're in an El Nino. That was from last year, so my bad on not updating the slide. But I wanted to show this one. This is from wet to dry. This is water year, meaning October through September. This was 2009 to 2010 when El Nino and other atmospheric teleconnections lined up perfectly to give us a really wet winter then and a pretty darn wet spring. And then we followed that with Hurricane Alex and then we had Tropical Storm Hermine. And I think we had some more rainfall in November, uh, no, in September, and then it ended. We turned off the spigot. Like we literally stopped it raining on September 28th, 2010, but it rained for like every, so many days until then. And so everyone in the um, wettest ranked years are in the pink, you can see that Brownsville wettest year, water year. McAllen was a wettest water year. A lot of other sites were number two. So there's the rainfall that's underneath that. You can see some areas got over 50 inches of rain. That's kind of like a rainforest type of rain amount. Um, 47 inches in Brownsville. We even had nearly 40 inches in the Mid Valley, in McAllen and Edinburgh. And even Zapata County, 29 inches, sixth wettest of all time. Uh, some of these records going back again to the 1800s. And then one year later, we went to dry. <clears throat> we turned the spigot off on September 28th, and we really didn't turn it back on again through the rest of the water year, going through uh, October 2011. And even that next water year was pretty dry, but not this dry. So we went from literally a, a near tropical rainforest in some parts of the valley to a desert in one water year. It just flipped the switch. Like we did last summer, right? We had this near record wet, June 20, well, it's actually March 28th to June 8th. It was actually second ranked wettest period all time in that window. And then on June 9th, we turned off the spigot. It barely rained again. And we just built up the heat and we broke all those records. So this was a small, this was a longer term version of it in 2009-10 to 2010-11. You can see what happened in October 2011. We haven't seen a map like this before or since. Um, I believe that's 95% of Texas was in the worst category of drought. Hence the $5 billion in agriculture, $4 billion fire, which unfortunately could be human caused, but the ag damage was, was huge that year. Um, and then 2012, we got a little better. 2013, we got better still. 2014, some areas up north re-droughted. Down here in the valley, at least, we were gone. So you could see year after year, we did improve a little bit, but 2011 was just wickedly bad. So where are we last year and this year, comparatively? There's last year's map. That was the earlier one you saw uh, for the region of Deep South Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Um, now you can see last year, severe 
to moderate drought across a lot of the area on January 17th. And this year, the most recent drought monitor, we have none down here. So all that rain, little and big, combined with um, lower temperatures overall than we had in the summer, um, ended up giving us a better situation. But I will say this about this map. It is a little deceiving, according to our ranchers and especially our crop growers. What they've told us is this. The water has definitely helped, but it has only brought up the soil moisture levels from way below average to just below average. So there's no runoff. When the rain happened in November, instead of having a gradual rise where you actually get some minor flooding and just a runoff situation where you could absorb more moisture into the soil, it didn't. It was like a sponge, just sucked it up. And so that was the big rain. We've had a little rain here and there, but I can tell you they're still thinking they're in drought right now. And they're very concerned with the forecast coming up because of issues with the reservoirs and what water won't be coming out of the reservoirs this spring because there is none to come down. So heat dryness leads to drought. Drought can lead to wildfire. Unfortunately, the vast majority, over 80% of wildfires in this country are started by humans. Anybody have an idea how they're started in our area? Meaning the ranch and farmlands. What's the number one reason for a fire start out there? Nope. Nope, no, lightning not here. Lightning once in a while, but not here really. We're not that dry. So what was that again? The uh, rarely is that the case because we coordinate with them on prescribed burns. So I'll give you an easier answer. I'll give you a hint. Something to do with cars. What do most Texans drive? They all pickup trucks, right? If a pickup truck, you know, F1, F2, F350, do my hacks big because they need it because they're hauling stuff out there. And it sparks underneath it. Uh oh. And then they might use welding equipment out there. The farmers can do that. And if they're using it on dead grass, known as tinder or litter, and a fire starts and there's a breeze out there and the humidity's low. It's all over. And before you know it, you've got thousands of acres on fire. Um, last year was interesting. We had fires on the King Ranch that burned, I think, a total of 80,000 or 70,000 acres. We think there's an issue with the ranch hands not understanding that they should not be driving in certain days their vehicles or welding or doing some ranch work in dry grass. A 51,000 acre fire started on the King Ranch in Clayburg County. And um, there were at least 20 firefighting crews that were out there putting out, as well as air tankers that were using water and retardant and whatnot. So Smoky, we have to follow Smoky. Um, 2011, 50,000 acres burned across our neck of the woods. 2022, 30,000 acres burned. That's what I just mentioned before, that the King Ranch fire was north of us. But we had a number of other ones on our King Ranch counties, which is Kennedy and Brooks, as well as other ones in Hidalgo, Star, um, we'll see. I think we'll see was okay, but Hidalgo star Jim Hogg and Zapata. And then this year we were doing great in spring. We thought the message got out that January to March period was very dry. We actually went to a prescribed burn that never happened. We we're going to do a test area of 10 acres, I think. They were going to do it for us to show how quickly it could burn. Because when they prescribe, they want to burn fast and get it down fast. They don't want a day like this where it won't burn. If it burns a little bit, it can duct and create smoke that just sits there for a day. They don't want that. They want to ventilate it, and get it out. Um, so the day we went there, we were hoping to do that, but we had 25, 30 mile an hour wind gusts, humidity of about 30%, temperatures near 90. It was February. And uh, so what they did was they did a really, really tiny area, just one drop, and they just burned it and they were able to put it out, but they couldn't do a real prescription to show us how they back burn and all that to keep it going and then be able to put it out. Uh, let the fire burn itself out over already burned fuel, if you will, in this case, grass. So they couldn't do it that day. And fortunately, though, the, the ranchers got the message that this spring would not be last spring or last spring, meaning one in 23. We had very little acres, I think 900 acres, is all we found from February and March, which is a dry period. And the rains came, which was great. But when rains come, what happens? The grass grows again. When the grass and the brush grow, it's now new tinder when the next drought comes. So the next drought came, and by July and August, which is normally not fire season here, 
people forgot that it was a new fire season and we ended up burning those 10,000 plus acres. Smaller fire, 3,000 here, 1,000 here, 4,000 here, but it added up to about 10,000. Still a lot better than the year before, but most of them were human caused, unfortunately. Any questions so far before I move on to rain and flooding? Going once, going twice, let's move on at 657. I think we're still doing good here. River Delta, low-lying flat, torrential rain has nowhere to flow. We just don't have good um, land here for water to flow. Most river deltas don't. Our soil type is impervious, though. We're not sand. There's sand here, we're sanding. I mean, it's a mix, actually, the Caliche and some sand. Farther east, it's all sand. But Kennedy County is like the only county with sand down here. Everybody else has a loamy, silty clay, right? And clay is really not good for, for drainage. Um, and soaking in is better for runoff. And when it rains hard, it uh, runs off. And we have dead grass like we have now from the freeze. We have runoff again if it rains really hard. Um, it can increase the hatching of vectors known as mosquitoes and other disease-carrying insects. We've had Zika. We've had West Nile. We've had other uh, dengue down here in the valley. Um, and there's a lot of treatment that goes on when you get these heavy rain events where they do spray to protect the uh, community. But that's just the nature of the beast. So again, those are the main, um, have all been deserved here. And other microbes can be increased as well. High standing water, it's not just mosquitoes, it's bacteria, trash eating bacteria, who knows, but not good. In, in warm standing water um, that's not touched, it can really be an issue because of the slow or poor drainage. So it's not just your backyard plant planters, it's gonna be the drainage areas, the canals, just the land itself can hold more water when it rains really, really hard. Of course, counter to that is the fact that, like I said before, the soil moisture levels are so low that's being sucked in. And so we're not seeing as much standing water after events as we did in prior years. So maybe that's a little bit of a benefit of climate change. I don't know, but we've had events down here, Dolly, and then we had all the floods from 2018 to 2021. So we call a freshwater flood by our definition for a flood warning, is three feet of more standing water, slightly lower amounts that can run into homes or businesses from heavy rain. Uh, river flood is based on high waters exceeding a flood stage of a gauge river or a stream or an arroyo. Uh, major floods can affect large swaths of property, cut off roads. We don't see that much here in the valley because most of our riverine environment is controlled by reservoirs, both on the US and Mexico side. But this is your high standing water, great example of it from Dolly in July, 2008. Uh, this is near Arroyo City, and it's just high standing water. I think that may be the Arroyo Colorado to the north there, but the rest of the water is just from the fact that it rained up to 20 inches over the course of about eight hours and didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, this is the um, rural Willacy County from October 2015, where we had six to nine inches of rain on a thunderstorm event, single thunderstorm event that just sat there on a Thursday the ground was already saturated from prior rain, so that rose a bit. And then we had the remnants of Hurricane Patricia, which came through on a Saturday and dropped another three to five inches of rain on top of this, and that was the result. Um, the farms have been plowed over. We have impervious soil. It, it does not drain into it, but rather just rises up on it. You can see these farmhouses are surrounded by two to three or four feet of water across the county, it was like widespread when you drove east of Raymondville and Lyford. Um, urban floods are most common. Uh, these can be really bad in terms of three or more feet of water, as you see in the upper left and lower left. To be a little bit lesser on the upper right where you have like two feet of water, still not great for that vehicle sitting there. Uh, but the other vehicles that are trapped on the other ones to the left are in uh, serious need of repair. So floods on the Rio Grande, before dams, the Rio Grande averaged flooding once every 10 years. Um, now it is um, fewer than that, but when it does flood, it can be pretty bad because you have to release water out of Falcon Dam or farther south out of Marty Gomez if it gets really bad down there. And that water is flowing into our river here. So here's some big flood stages. Beulah was one, Alex was another. Uh, 1972 was may have been 71, that date may be off, but it was Hurricane Fern, I think, and some other rainfall where the water got very high out of Rio Grande City. But you can see 
um, how high the water can get, but we have a flood control system, which is shown in the lower two pictures. That is the floodway, where the water comes out of the dam, it goes into the river to near Anzaldúas and Hidalgo, and then it gets diverted by a weir into the floodway. <clears throat> and we have the main floodway, the with the banker, the main, and the north. And that's where the water goes. Photo on the left there, that is the main floodway between McAllen and Westlaco. And the one on the right is the north floodway near Sebastian. And so when you drive over those bridges, most of the time it's, it's hay. It might be just plain old grassland or brush. Maybe there's some farming done in there. But then you get into an event where you have to drain the water from the reservoirs and flow it so it doesn't flood the valley. Um, you'll see water that's in there. We've had that. Uh, most memorable case was Hurricane Alex <clears throat> back in uh, 2010. And that water was flowing for about two months from late June until the end of August. And we got a resurgence in September. It didn't quite go all the way down until the fall um, when we had the, the cutoff of the rain, right? I mentioned that before. So flooding from elsewhere, like I said, Stark County, uh, that's the Rio Grande, usually uh, 50 yards wide, in that case, two miles wide. That was from the Alex event, released the water out of uh, Falcon Dam, and it's going to flood the river. Um, inside the levee, there's this uh, chimney park, RV park for winter Texans that come down. They're inside the levee, and when that happens and the water flows, it can flood them. So they had to come down and check on their properties that they have left there, whether it's an RV or a small home, and it was under several feet of water back then. And there's your North Floodway, US 83 Mercedes. That's the when you drive over uh, Interstate 2 now, of course. You drive over from Mercedes to Westlaco, you get that long bridge there. That's over the floodway. And if you ever drove it during the 2010 event, it was kind of neat to see all the water in there. Fortunately, the water's contained and it didn't affect properties. But it's not just an event like that where you have a tropical cyclone dropping 50 inches or 70 inches of rain on Sierra Madre flowing into the reservoir, which we need water from, but it's too much, they have to release it and open the dam wide. Uh, we get floods from other things like thunderstorm complexes that happen sometimes every year, which was the case between 2018 and 2000 and, oops, 2021. So a storm with no name, right? The great June 18 flood. These are people walking through it. There's a person in this picture or not, maybe not this one, but it's, um. Hold on, this is going too fast. The middle button's weird because it should be a forward and back, but it's just forward. I'm losing my TV remote where you have the right side is forward, the left side is back. So I'm hitting that, that's why it's doing what it's doing. So let me back up again. So again, the rainfall from this event, 18 inches McAllen missions, uh, 12 inches um, near Los Fresnos, 17 in uh, Harlingen, in Harlingen and in McAllen, um, in Santa Rosa, I think these were all greater than Beulah rainfall. There's actually heavier rain in Star County with Beulah, but it doesn't take a tropical storm to make it any really hard. So here's how it played on, on satellite. Watch the red areas. The red areas are high cloud tops, meaning thunderstorms. You see it in Mexico too, but we're really watching the Western Gulf here and watch what happens over time. And I've got a little annotation here. Anybody see a tropical cyclone? You all know what they look like. Anybody see one? There's not one there, right? It's just clouds reforming. There's an atmospheric disturbance, an upper level disturbance that was slowly moving westward. And as it did, it brought all of that moisture onto the coast and it rained from the 18th to the 22nd of June. You can see that here. This is moving from like 17th of June all the way to the 22nd. There's our big day right there. You see the the dark maroon colors. That was the big flood that closed the frontage road for McAllen all the way to Mission, all the way to Arlington. Um, then we had another round the next day that hit McAllen Mission northwestward and caused flooding there, but not farther east. So um, it was just an upper level disturbance that was moving west in the tropical flow early in that case. This is more September looking than June looking. But in this particular year, it happened in June. It, it can do that sometimes. <clears throat> so here's radar. This is the big one for the valley overall. Uh, you see red on the radar, and it just doesn't go anywhere. It's sitting there for hours on end. And when it's red on the radar and it's moisture laden to the max, 
you're dropping two, three, four inches per hour. We actually had four inches per hour rainfall rates uh, just east of Westlaco. We think a total of 18 inches fell there in the course of about four or five hours. And that created that five feet of water that you saw in that first picture. So that was June 20th in the morning. And there's some of the stats from it. 11.36 inches of rain in three hours, four to five inches per hour. Nothing here is gonna be able to hold that water in without flooding the region. But we have built some capacity, especially in Hidalgo County, to help out with flooding for lesser cases, but even these can get a little bit of assistance from better drainage systems out west. Uh, but you can see 2,500 homes and businesses had uh, 18 inches of water depth, which is considered major damage or destruction. And then all the schools in Westlaco flooded, the entire fleet of buses was unusable. Fortunately, the school was out at that point in time, but you see the, what happened. June 20th in the afternoon, same day. Now we've taken the boundaries from those storms, combined it with the disturbance in the atmosphere. And now we're dumping rain right in our backyard here. Uh, Los Fresnos yeah. over to Bayview, over to Brownsville, three to five inches fell. What happened was it's, it rained really hard on the 19th as well, same areas. And when you combined it, this is what east of Los Fresnos, actually right down the road. If you go west on 100, you go north on any one of those track roads, that's what it looked like in there. So uh, the water couldn't flow anywhere. It just rose three, four feet of water. If there's a house in the way, that was a problem. So uh, this was taken on June 21st, I think, was the film, maybe the 20th of the afternoon. But you can kind of see the idea here. Second consecutive afternoon, total rain six to 10 inches, but it never had a chance to evaporate because it rained one afternoon into the evening. It was wet all night, kind of drippy. The next day, it, it got really warm and humid quickly, and it never dried up, and the rains just kind of percolated on top of each other. So the first day primed the pump, the second day created the flood. So that one was 2018. This one was 2019, and it's interesting because 2019, the heaviest rains fell to the west of where we're sitting now, unless you're sitting out there in western Cameron, eastern Hidalgo. One of the things that's interesting is that the location of the heaviest rains was near Santa Rosa, La Feria, same area that got some of the heaviest rains in 2018. So two years in a row, some areas out there were getting doubly hit. And there were neighborhoods that literally flooded twice in, in two years. And they got some drainage done, uh, projects underway in 2019 after a bond initiative passed, but they weren't all completed by the time this one hit. Now, after that, they did complete some, and it did help, we believe, in 2020, when Hurricane Hannah did the same thing later on. So again, not a tropical cyclone. Check this out. Thunderstorms came down from originally Dallas-Fort Worth to Houston area, to the middle Texas coast, and then look at this in Mexico. This is a big blossom of storms in Mexico. They linked up with the other ones, and you get that white and maroon color there in the clouds. That's where some really big rains fell, 15 more inches in Santa Rosa. But the atmosphere was mean that day. But it did not take any tropical event to do it. It was just the atmosphere creating the lift necessary for those kind of storms. So any questions on flooding? We can save them to the end. Hopefully, I'll give you a little time at the very end here for some more discussion. Let's talk hail and wind storms. Favors mid-March through the end of May, but can start in February and linger into June. Talk more about that um, in the event, actual event shortly. Large hail more common than damaging wind, believe it or not. Um, we've had a few more hail events over the course of years since 96. So going back now 28 years. Um, but damaging wind has more potential devastating impact, especially among poorly constructed substandard buildings. And we have a lot of them. We're working on a project to fix that, by the way. Try to fix that. Um, hail size has been giant several times, three plus inches in diameter. But damaging wind can reach 80 mile per hour or higher. We're going to show you some examples of that in a minute. This event, however, was 65 to 72. It was actually below hurricane force. I surveyed this area. I call it last stair standing. This was a colonia that was literally blown away. It was blown away because it had none of the ABCs. It had no anchoring, had no bracing, and no connectors. It was just kind of sitting there with whatever materials the family could put in to have a roof over their head to live in. Fortunately, the family got out in time. Now, I don't know if it was this house or one nearby, 
But there was a family of eight that had a pickup truck and they all squeezed into it and got out when they heard the winds coming up and they just beat it by five minutes. Had they all been in there, who knows what would have happened to them. Uh, injuries for sure, uh, deaths probably in some cases. That was 2015, so was this. Um, this is North Donna, 20, April 24th. Now this case, the home is better constructed. Not perfect, but at least they could take protection in the interior if they needed to. But unfortunately, the, the uh, roof connectors and braces, so it's a kind of a BC here, failed. And off came part of the roof, which isn't good even if you're inside. Uh, but at least the wall stood and the anchoring was there. So good, good on them. But still, you can't have that. You just don't want to have that when the winds are just under hurricane force. And then we have this. <laughs> this is a great story. It shows how shoddy construction can happen even to buildings that they invested $4 million in. This is from the city or town of Granjano, which is part of the Mission District over in Hidalgo County. And this building was meant to be a shelter. So it doubled as a gymnasium. They had little mini bleachers in there for kids to play and had their parents watch games. But it was meant to be a shelter first and foremost. And if you look at it closely, you see it's got cinder block walls. A lot of places here don't have cinder block walls. You're probably asking me, Barry, why the heck is that building destroyed if it has cinder block walls? Shoddy construction. Look at the top. At the top, there is no connection between that wall and that roof structure. So it's literally sitting on or connected to nothing. Remember I said anchors, braces, and connectors? Zero connector. So a big bad wolf came along with 80 to 95 mile per hour winds blowing straight directly at that wall and he huffed and he puffed and he blew the wall in. And once the wall blew in, the other wall on the right there, the winds go in, they gotta come out, right? Out they went. <clears throat> the mayor was not too happy with my assessment of the storm. It had to be over 100. I said, no, it wasn't, ma'am. I said, you got a problem with your construction. No, it wasn't. We had the best in the business. No, you didn't. So be very wary of who's building your house down here and anywhere. Straight line winds. Yeah, directly hit that directly. <clears throat> so this event was last year. Uh, we all remember that our severe weather season, mid-March to end of May, well, we had one last year. Started a little later, around April 21st, but it kept going until about May, about Memorial Day. Into June, actually, we had a couple of events in June that were on the edge, right? But we had our severe weather season, April 21st, April 23rd, April 29th, May 9th, May 13th, May 25th, and then a couple in June, June 3rd and June 7th and 8th, I think. So all of them had some kind of damage, but the big one for the Valley was this one, April 29th, Midnight Madness. Overnight events are real big here because of the nature of how storms form. Straight line wind, 85 to 95, there's a gas station. And if you looked really closely at the bottom, those are rusting. All those stanchions, those piers that are connecting to the ground, they're rusting. So once the wind hits it and <clears throat> it hits those rusting and it rattles them, that roof is a sail and whoo, over it goes. So that looks really ugly and it is, but the winds aren't as strong as you might think because of the rusting the uh, rusting beams or rusting pillars that were there. The construction matters. <clears throat> and then came Laguna Heights, right here, like five miles south, whether it be five miles away from that. So you all probably remember, this was a tornado, very thin track, very small scale, by the way, but it did show up on radar. <clears throat> but you want to talk about substandard construction? I'm on my soapbox for two minutes here. There's no excuse for this when you're four miles, right, by the bird flies from the coast. We have something called Inland Code uh, for Cameron County, Inland One, Inland Two. How many people have heard of that? If you have the Texas Windstorm Insurance Association, you know what that is. Um, on the beach, it is known as Coastal Code, which is almost the same as Miami-Dade in Florida, which is what it should be everywhere, in my opinion. But hey, it's not my call right now. But this is what bugs me. This should be on the edge of coastal code and yet we've allowed we societally have allowed laguna heights to be an eyesore and be laden with poorly constructed buildings and six of them were 
blown away. Anchors, braces, connectors, no anchoring, gone. 100 mile hour wind will do that, right? And in every case, not every case, but in the cases where these homes were demolished like that, there was an injury, in one case was a, a fatality. Um, this is the case of, I think, where the death occurred on the left, yeah, on the left, the right side, not shown here, um, but the death occurred in that building there. You can see how dilapidated that building is. Four miles from the beach in a tropical zone. This, this is not acceptable, okay? Because I got to survey it, and people ask me, what was the wind? How'd that happen? Like, well, it happened because the buildings were not constructed well. That's why it happened. Yes? What level was the hurricane? <laughs> I mean, the tornado that hit that. So we have five levels of tornadoes, and it's based on a combination now of the wind speed, but also what's called damage indicators and degree of damage. So we have to look very closely at the construction processes. We've become a little like mini wind engineers or architectural engineers to do this. And we work with the wind engineers to figure it out. So I had somebody tell me, that had to be 175 mile an hour wind, look how bad it is. I'm like, no, your house stood, dude. The one next to it was blown away. Two head injuries required uh, hospitalizations, like emergency room visit. They were blown away. Um, the winds were nowhere near 175 because if they were, even the average construction would have seen severe damage to possible full destruction. We did not have that looking at height. So I have aerial flights. You can see how that looked. Some of the buildings that are not well constructed, but at least able to withstand 90, 100 mile per hour winds did survive. They had damage, but they survived it. That's how we rate. So there's a five level scale when it combines the wind and the indicators. And this one rated at the number one scale out of five. Five is the worst. Zero is the best or the lowest, and one is the next level up. We rated it at one. Oh, the first okay. person looks at, people might look at that and say, I had it before. And you see this on television, the media say, they haven't rated it yet, they're surveying. We're surveying because we need to look at the construction. <laughs> That's why you don't hear like this devastating area of damage and it's not just automatically a five or a four. A lot of times we're seeing threes and twos in better built areas, but <clears throat> we're seeing shoddy construction not inspected well. So here's an event here that occurred north of the valley and north of the Colonias. And on radar, the winds are indicating over 100 miles per hour on radar. And sure enough, the winds were 105 at a, a wind farm that was being demoed. They actually had sensors on it up at uh, 33 feet was where we measure on 100 mile hour wind gusts. Imagine if that had been 30 miles farther south. This is up in northern Hidalgo County. You can see where it is, Lynn, north of Lynn, um, off of 281 there. You go down south of Fayesville, the colonia is there. You go down to Monte Alto, there's a bunch of colonias there. Um, from Monte Alto westward to west of Fayesville and southwest to near Edinburgh. And if that storm had hit just 30 miles south, we would have been picking up bodies from that storm. Not good, not good. <clears throat> hailstorm, McAllen hailstorm, March 29, 2012. $600 million in insured property damage at one point. I'm not sure if that number held the end, but initial values were 100 to 250 million. And then we kept getting claims for, I think, three years. And it got up to 600 million. It was bad because it hit a uh, one of the highest um, income slash property value census tracts in the valley, you know, east side of McAllen. And it hit them dead on. And with the 74 mile per hour winds driving the hail, every north facing exposure got severe damage. And they had to be, in some cases, temporarily uninhabitable until they fixed it. We were driving ice balls the size of ping pongs or even quarters at 74 mile per hour for 45 minutes straight. You're going to strafe the siding off of buildings. And, and see the cars as well when you're driving hailstones, even if they're smaller, quarter size. But if you're driving them for 45 minutes, you're going to total the vehicle, and that's what happened. I think it was $6 million lost at the BMW dealer on 10th and Nolana from that event. <clears throat> so real Honda, we had a spotter or someone who had calipers measuring the, the, the width of that hailstone being over three inches. Uh, you can see the radar core. When you see a radar that shows all that red above the freezing level, which is the red line, there's a little red line there. It's the freezing level. Look at all the red above that. That's ice. That's a lot of hail that's forming up. And ultimately, gravity is going to pull that down. Uh, I want to zip through lightning really fast because uh, we're going to run up on time here. 
Lightning, we don't get a lot of it. As I mentioned before, you can see Houston gets a lot more. Uh, I think this is still fairly current. I don't know if this changed over the years, but we get between one and two strikes to the ground per square mile per year. That means everybody gets it, at least one strike near your house, you know. But Houston gets a lot more. But when it comes, it comes with a vengeance. A storm like I showed before, that one that just missed the valley, that had tons of lightning in it. So you were getting 300 strikes in 15 minutes over, over like a 10 square mile area on average, like just huge amounts of cloud to ground strikes. And so it causes fires and stuff too. Um, hurricanes, let's see what time we're at. I don't want to lose track. Almost done. Okay, so I'm going to zip through this quickly. Um, animals, birds tend to sense the arrival well in advance. Destroyed natural habitat can slow recovery, return to wildlife that escapes. We're going to go over some cases across the Caribbean um, and the Gulf, I think. So vectors or pests will seize the opportunity. We know about that from hurricanes when people are evacuated. Pine bark infestation following Hurricane Katrina. Um, this is now old. It's almost, uh, we'll get close to the 20th anniversary of Katrina in two years. But you can see what it did. Um, wipe that out. But look at the Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, the top picture there. It's beautiful green. <laughs> They're sitting right on the Gulf there. Not a good place to live, I don't think, but people do. Better have insurance. But beautiful green trees there behind them. So it's not a truly tropical environment. It's kind of subtropical. And look what happened after Katrina. All the salt water, first of all, the wind blows all the leaves off the trees. And then the salt water comes in and turns everything brown and it stays that way for months. I mean, it takes sometimes a year to recover that, you know, area. Uh, this was from the U.S. Virgin Islands. This was from, Marie, let's see, Irma, Category 5 hurricane. And you get the idea. This is not colored in. That's green, lush land around St. Thomas Virgin Islands, uh, Tortola, Virgin Gorda. And you can see it's brown after Hurricane Irma got through with the Virgin Islands. Um, Katrina's impact on wetlands. You had a lot more available islands in the Chandelier Islands in 2001 versus 2006. And they haven't really come back. I think there's a waxing and waning of some of those islands, but never what they were before Katrina devastated them. It's not just Louisiana or the Caribbean. It's also Texas. Um, Bolivar Peninsula, Hurricane Ike, before and after. Um, all these homes were there. Some of them were on stilt and were raised, and that's great. But what happened? Storm surge with lots of wave action pummeled the coastline there. And if it hits one of those buildings and takes this debris into the next building, it's the equivalent of blowing it away, right? Water is really darn powerful stuff. So what do you think Bolivar Peninsula looks like now? Does it look like the before or does it look like the after? Well, we'll look at the after because it would have been scoured. Do you think it looks like the before? The answer is yes. I think even more homes there now than were before. So... A 20-foot storm tide is coming someday, and we'll probably take care of that. They've raised the homes. You know, they, they, they may be up to 25 feet, so maybe they survive. But if the damage comes in from another building and the waves are higher than that, it could cause a re repeat performance. Uh, here's Harvey before and after in Rockport. Same idea as what we saw with Ike. Here's Irma. I mentioned that before with the overflight of the Caribbean. This is Barbuda. Left side, you see the green, you see the buildings are still standing, although you're, you're overshooting them with a drone or actually aircraft. On the right, there's very few homes left. You just see all the debris scattered around. This was a category five with winds estimated, I think at 175 to 200. Hurricane Michael is our version of that in the States. That's in Florida on the coast. You've got uh, Mexico Beach, I think it's called, and the upper left before and the lower right, a lot of those buildings are no longer. And again, the landscape turned brown and ugly, and it lasts for about a year. 2022 was our last big monster to hit the states. So we did have a storm last year. Uh, the eye storm, Idalia, was pretty, pretty bad, but it didn't hit the population as much as Ian did. Ian was worse. Ian was a five right before landfall. And this is what the storm surge did to Fort Myers Beach, a place which I know well. I'd only been there a couple times, but I do kind of remember the look of the left. Look on the right is what it, what happened after Ian got through with it. Then there's our Hurricane Hannah in 2020, July 25th and 26th, my birthday storm, July 26th. So I had fun. My, my July 26th was a 14-hour shift followed by IHOP. So my birthday dinner was at IHOP. 
And the next day, we're out for another 12-hour day surveying the damage. And the day after that, we were surveying a flood. So it was uh, kind of nonstop, but eventually you get to do a birthday. I think the following weekend, we had a nice time. Well, there's a rainfall from Hannah. And once again, there's Santa Rosa, eastern Hidalgo, western Cameron there, La Feria, 15 inches of rain, three years in a row. So when we go out there to speak to people, what do they think first? The flood's going to hit again. They remember it. That's like their repeat event that they had uh, three years in a row, slightly different time of the year. But Mission got hit pretty hard, uh, 14 inches of rain. And then in the southern eye wall that went across Raymondville, east of Raymondville, down to north of Harlingen, some pretty heavy rain. Over here, we didn't do so badly. We got rain that we kind of needed. Um, but Hurricane Hannah was kind of a glancing blow for the location we're sitting in right now. Freezes and cold, well, we all know what just happened a couple days ago or a week ago. Um, it can be really bad. Um, sea turtles, we had a three-day event this time. We did not forecast three days. We only forecast two. And on Tuesday morning, it's like, we better start promoting sea turtle rescue because they're going to do a lot of it. Uh, 950 is the last number I heard. Last December, we had 178. But, of course, with Yori in February 2021, we had 7,500. It took the convention center and turned it into a rescue center. Um, but that was really bad. We were down in the low 20s for hours. And um, the water temperature went down to the upper 30s. And it was already cold to begin with. Like, it was already beginning a stun event, and it just maximized out. But this was 2021. $305 million damage likely to citrus, 1 to 1.5 billion. Uh, to all agricultural models counted, that's what we think. We don't have a final number, but it was bad here in the valley. Ornamental plants damage, those emperor palms or Cuban palms. There's still a few out there in Port Isabel and South Padre, but people were planting them all the way over to Brownsville, and guess what? They lost them all. In my neighborhood, we had at least 150. We're down to two right now. So uh, they're not made for this climate. We're climate 8A. I think it's 9A in South Florida where they have the Gulf Stream. That does keep the really, really big freezes away. Not here. Remember I mentioned one-sided peninsula, the freight train of Arctic air? Don't plant emperor palms. Don't plant anything that's tropical that grows in South Florida. It will not last here because at some point, it's going to get got by a freeze. Um, so there's the sea turtle issue. 10,500. Um, you yeah, have more than 6,000 on South Padre, 10,500 in Texas alone. That was a really nasty event. And this is what the weather map looked like setting it up back then. There's the temperatures across the state. Single digits across central and north Texas. Austin, I think, was down at seven. We had blizzard conditions in parts of the state north of here there where there's a disturbance that helped to create dry, powdery snow. Um, and then, of course, we all know about the power. We almost lost the state of power back then. We just did escape that. The St. Valentine's Day massacre, I like to call it. This was the other palm tree that got damaged. This is like a little queen palm. Not in my yard. My queen palm didn't make it. There's your royal palm right there, your Cuban royal, that has brown singeing on it. This was taken, I think, on Friday that week. But it was only a matter of time before that beautiful little green trunk turned uh, ugly gray or something. And then that was it. Off, out came the chainsaws. <laughs> a lot of them came down. Citrus loss, you can see the fruit damaged and destroyed on the ground. Um, we did lose some trees, but I think most of them were able to be saved. But the um, fruit was gone, and the beginnings of the spring budding had started, and that was wiped out. So what was lost mostly wasn't the fall fruit from the year before in winter, because a lot of it was already picked. That's kind of just residual right there. It was the next year's crop, the 2022 crop. was not wiped out, but I think it was one half of it was, was eliminated by the fact that the buds that had started were completely frozen up. There's a sea turtle event on South Padre at the convention center. And there's the records that were shattered. So it's interesting that only Brownsville uh, did not, um, uh, it broke a record too, but barely, uh, because we had a year in 1895 when there were a lot less people here, a lot fewer people than we had uh, the hard freeze. But other locations that don't date back that far, going back to the four, 1940s, 1950s, just crushed the record. 13 degrees below the prior record, 12 degrees below the prior record, what have you. And the fact that it happened so late in the winter is a big reason why the damage was so bad. Had it happened in early January, late December, probably not as bad. They're still bad, but probably not as bad. But the lateness in the season when things were starting to percolate up with the sun angle and to get wiped out. So, uh, and then here's the low maximum temperatures. This is the daytime highs on the 15th of February. Again, late in the year, 
to be that cold that long. Some places didn't even get above freezing on that day. And look how far departures from the prior record these were. Prior records, 40s, 50s degrees, right? 30s, that also helps to really influence your damage on your trees. 2011 ice storm, who remembers this one? Early February. Um, this was the winter snow in 2017 in December. Beautiful event. Wet snow didn't cause any freezes because it didn't last long. It was 32, 33 degrees during it. But out across ranch country, it was beautiful out there, that snow there in um, Rio Grande City fires out near uh, Rio Grande City. Uh, there's a quick review of 27, 18, 17, 18. That was an interesting winter. So we had eight sharp cold snaps. Um, day to day change of 25 degrees or more. And after December, we had a freeze event in mid January, similar to the time frame as this one. There's all the snow from December 8th that year. There's the map of the snow, lots of one inch areas, but look to the west, you have three to six inches out west. Here's the pattern 2004. I don't think I have it here. And there's the. Did I knock that out? No, that was just. Oh, okay. And, and there we have uh, the pattern of the atmosphere. It's called cross polar flow. And that northerly flow in, yeah, in the atmosphere um, brings the cold air down all the way into the southern US. And that means for us, uh, we're going to get some cold weather as well, enough to make it snow. Now, what's interesting about this case was the coldest of air where it got Arctic did stay up in the Great Lakes in the upper Midwest. And what we ended up getting was a piece of it that was just cold enough to make it snow because the atmosphere was colder. These, these lines there are the lines of equal height in the atmosphere. When they get as low as they were getting across Texas, that turned the rain into snow. But the lower levels weren't as cold as they were in February 2021. It's kind of interesting how that works out. Because the source region of the Arctic air, if you look at the map there, it stayed to the east. See that big upper level low is moving eastward? Over to the west in Montana and into southwestern Canada, it's warm. So we got a glancing blow from that, fortunately. Otherwise, it could have been a combination of snow and uh, very sub-freezing temperatures, which would have been a wipeout event, like we had in 89. <clears throat> so watching for pelicans, sometimes we have pelican issues. They did fix the bridge. We heard with this last event, it wasn't too bad. We heard no incidences. But we found that when it's a combination of strong north winds and light rain or drizzle, like we had last weekend, the pelicans going to their roosting um, location on the north side of the Gaiman Bridge up on the Bahia Grande, uh, they will uh, hit the bridge or they'll get hung up in the wind eddies and cars will come and hit the pelicans. We've had hundreds get killed, but over the years we've had volunteers come out and help slow the traffic down and save the pelicans. That was an ice storm in 2018. I, again, I didn't put this year's up yet. It was just too late to have a chance to update that. Um, and spacebar. I got more. There we go. Weather and man made disasters. I show this one every year because of what happened um, in Louisiana. These are all events from Deepwater Horizon. I think this is also from Deepwater Horizon. Um, some people say it might be from Pemex um, oil that came out of the east side of Mexico that drifted. I think this was actually from deep water because we had Tropical Storm Lee come into Louisiana at the same time or a couple days earlier, and our water flow shifted from the general southeast to northwest or east to west to northeast to southwest. That's where the swell direction came. And a couple days later, we had these tar mounds on the beach. It's like, wait, how did that happen? It happened awful quick. I think that's what did it. So deep water had, had happened earlier that spring. Um, in two, actually happened in 2010, uh, but it was going all the way into what, October, November. And so there was still lots of residual. And this was the first time we had a northeasterly swell direction. I think that may be what it came from on well, Labor Day next year. So real quick to close, and I will open up for any questions. I'm running a little late here, sorry about that. Late winter and spring, February through April. This is brand new, just came off the press. Last week, we'll be updating our webpage tomorrow to have a, a little story about this. but. Um, what the forecast is, this comes from our climate prediction center. They look at a number of models. They look at things like El Nino, uh, La Nina, whatever the phase is, other connections, and they come up with a forecast. And once again, like we see most of the winter, the precipitation forecast is key 
You notice the area where the better opportunity for heavy rain is the Florida Peninsula up into Georgia and Alabama, right? That's where they've gotten it so far. I didn't put the map up, but the heaviest rain this winter has been there. And in Texas, we have done well. This last event, we finally broke the back of some of the dryness in central and east Texas. But notice the line there on the right. It does cover central and east Texas with above, with above average potential. But in west Texas, it's equal chances. Could be drier, could be wetter, could be around normal. And the reason is because of what we already saw this winter. We've been waving to a lot of the rain. We got some rain this week, but not a lot. You know, a little bit here, a little bit there. But December was dry. Parts of January have been dry. Before, before we got the rain this week, it was bone dry in January with the freeze and all that. The week before that, it was windy and dry, right? So we're not getting a lot of rain via El Nino here. Um, and that's the forecast February through April. Uh, Temperature-wise, it's interesting, though. They've got below average forecast temperatures across the Big Bend. Um, that's because we're looking at these low pressure systems coming atmospherically from California into West Texas, New Mexico, bringing cooler than average air, maybe into March. Then we'll see how April goes. But that confidence in that forecast for me is kind of low to medium. I'm not sure we're going to be below average just to our west, but I understand why the forecast is what it is. So those waves come through, but they push the better moisture to the east of them, pulling in the Gulf of Mexico moisture towards Florida, Alabama, uh, Georgia versus even Louisiana versus our part of Texas. So that's why you're getting that, that difference there. But this is probably the most scary one for me when it comes to what's going to happen with our reservoirs this year. So the, this map has changed completely as we get later in the spring and early summer, actually a good chunk of summer right there. And it's changed because we're now forecasting a La Nina to develop we get into summer, we're literally going to flip the script on this El Nino, which has been moderate to strong for a while, really going back to last summer. But now we're looking at it changing sharply uh, by mid-spring. By the time we get to summer, we're on the other, other side. And typically, early to mid-summer, La Nina leads to drier than average weather here. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. A hurricane could sneak through the cracks and get us. But if it doesn't, the La Canicula Ridge will, will set up and be the dominant feature as it was last year, despite the fact that we were in El Nino. So that looks like what they're trying to forecast. So if you go to April, May, June in the middle, the May, June, July on the right, you have above average temperature forecast, not by much, it's just a little bit above that 33% line. But the below average rainfall, the problem with that map is the area that's showing a 40 to 50% probability below average, which means only a 22% chance of above average, is right over Amistad Reservoir's headwaters. And Amistad needs to be able to feed Falcon, if Falcon is low, to feed our agricultural interests here. Amistad is at an all-time calendar record since November uh, low. It's way off the charts from where it should be. And typically in the spring, there's some rain off the Sierra Madre, there's rain, there's all the water flows that come in from Mexico and even the US that rise the levels of Amistad a little bit, not a ton, but a little bit on average. If that forecast pans out, there's no rise. And the normal rise, we're just sitting at the, at the floor. And so they will have no water to give. Well, guess what? Mexico doesn't have the water either. They only have a couple of reservoirs that are 70% you know, of capacity. Others are like 10, 20, 40. So they're not going to give that water up. They're required by treaty to give it up. You might know about the treaty, right? 1944 treaty. They don't have it, they're not giving it. Would you? You wouldn't give it. They got agriculture too. They're not gonna give it up. So <clears throat> we have to figure it all out in terms of water. There are a number of communities that are under stage two water conservation slash water use restrictions in the valley. The number had grown to seven or eight back in October. It might have been reduced since because some of the local rainfall can be retained a bit, but we don't do a great job at water retention here. I gotta be honest with you. So now the, the concern is, if the reservoirs can't provide water to a lot of our communities, and again, the Rosacas here help the Cameron County area, but they don't exist in Hidalgo or Star County, so how are they going to get water? Um, and then with increasing heat, increasing drought, increasing evaporation, you're losing the ability to retain any water you do get. So um, this is a scary forecast, and hopefully we break it, but if we have to rely on tropical events, meaning cyclones from storms to hurricanes, to relieve our water situation by dumping that into the reservoirs, 
if that's the only way we're going to get it in the future, we got to figure something out and fast. So irrigation techniques will help. You got to not flood a field with water when they give you water rights. You just have to drip irrigate. You got to desalinate where we can, as we can. You got to conserve. So conservation is huge. <clears throat> and we got to try innovation um, and reclamation. Water and grass. When I lived in Florida, we used toilet water to water our grass. It was the sewer system. And they reclaimed it. They basically got most of the crud out of it, but it wasn't clean. You couldn't drink it, but the plants could use it. it smelled like sulfur. It cost me pennies a day to use it. And it's because it was reclaimed, recycled water. There's a little bit down here, but nothing like there. We're not going to be able to water grass and stuff without reclamation. So reclamation, um, irrigation techniques, desalination, and of course, conservation. The four Asians are going to get us there. That is not a good forecast. And so we'll have to see how it plays out. But um, it's a very high level discussion that I'm way above my pay grade. It, it's literally between two state departments on how to figure this all out. But you can't just blame one or the other anymore. It, it, the climate, the heat, the drought forecasting, um, that, that has nothing to do with politics. It's just the reality of where we're at. So hate to close on a down note. But let's hope for a, a, a nice spring. And I'll open up for any questions. I know it's delayed, I know we're late by 10 minutes, but if anyone has any questions, I can answer them. Come on. Any good news? Well, the good news is we've had some rain, and we, maybe we get some more events into February. So, uh, and the other good news is, I'm going to knock wood on this one, because we're not through February yet. But the Arctic that dropped in for, you know, gave us a nice visit last week, is locked up again. Remember in December, we had no snow and, you know, it was like, white Christmas, there's brown, it's brown in International Falls, Minnesota. We had people come by last week, our booth. That's the first time I've ever seen brown in my home, International Falls. And of course, he said, here's my webcam now, I got 20 inches of snow, you know? So we got the Arctic blast, but it's all bottled back up again. So it just came down, paid us a visit, and now it's locked up again like it was in December. And there's no sign of it coming south anytime soon from the North Pole at least through, let's say, February 10th. Now, that said, I don't want to rule out another event like 21, just not as bad, but another break in the pattern where we can drive it down here. But the, the chances are really slimming down right now. Our best opportunities for those Arctic freezes really are between mid-December and, and early February. We already had it. So that's good news. We should be done with that. Um, now we're into still what's left of some rainy El Nino season. It's not raining a ton, but these rains that, if we can get them into February, will percolate up the growth because it'll turn things green as the sun gets higher in the sky, helping your gardens to grow, which will be good. And um, then we have to see how March plays out in April and May. Um, the, the bad news would be another severe weather season. Of course, that would give us rain and keep it going. Um, the other bad news could be we go droughty. You know, we kind of cut the spigot off that we're seeing this winter. We start building ridges of high pressure, or we get westerly flow, it dries out. And we don't have the kind of rain. That's what that April, May, that April, May, June one bugs me because April, May is two months of our spring. And it's got a pretty big swath of below. We don't see that very often in our forecasts when you're coming out of an El Nino. In, you know, when you're in La Nina, yes. When you're coming out of El Nino into La Nina, it typically goes equal chances. But I think they're banking on recent history. We've had these dry springs where we've had um, the pattern shift, and maybe that's what they're going with. And, Maybe that fails to verify would help us out, but if it does verify, all the benefits of the water we see now will become moderate drought by mid-spring and possibly severe drought, level two out of four, uh, by the time we get to June and July. And that's gonna combine with heat. Now, how much heat, we don't know yet. Um, it's interesting that they have the equal chances nose coming down the plains. I'm not sure what that means for us. It could mean that we have a gradual increase in heat rather than that searing hot June that we saw last year. But I don't have an answer for that. The gradual increase we could handle would help a little bit slow down some of the evaporation, but it's still above average. And average, as we all know, where at that point of the year, May, June, uh, April, May, June, May, June, July, we're going into the hotter to near hell period. So um, it wouldn't be good to be above average when the average, based on 1999 and 2020, is near 100 in McAllen by the time you get to mid-July and 98 by the time you get to mid-June. Over here, it's like 95. 
So if you're above that, you're looking at 97, 96 every afternoon, and that's still pretty darn hot. So that's not really good news on that map, but we'll see how it plays. But this trend is brand new, and we've been seeing it in some of the modeling that came before this uh, when the La Nina was starting to show its signs of, of developing rapidly come later spring and summer. Now, that could be more hurricane season. That isn't good news either if that happens, but honestly, tropical event would be just what we need. We need the water. We just have to deal with protecting ourselves from the wind. So I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you, Barry. OK. Um, second part of class is Rolanda Garza. I left my bio back there for you. So you're just going <laughs> to. I'll get it. I'll tell you about the problem. Yeah, he's, he's going to tell you about himself. And give us some good news. Yeah. Uh, okay, I got good news and bad news. The good news is I'm not going to end on a bad note. The bad news is I think I can, I think I can out talk Barry. Okay, that's the bad news. <laughs> All right. Um, and I was prepared to start at 7:30. Robert said if we do go over, I, I guess at nine o'clock we can decide we want to stay or not. If it's boring or not. Uh, but Robert says if we go over, we get credit, all the credit for the time we stay over. Or y'all do, I don't as a as a as a student. Okay, let me see about Okay. I'm Rolando Garza, I'm an archaeologist, and I'm gonna talk about archaeology of the Rio Grande Delta. What is archaeology? Archaeology is a study of past human cultures through the material culture remains utilizing the scientific method. What does that mean? What's left behind? We try and put in hard perimeters. Uh, so as we look, the excavation units and grids and all that, everything is systematically done and documented. So not only we get the information, because we're gonna the data we get has to be empirical, has to be solid. So not only us can interpret, but somebody in the future or somebody at the same time can look at the raw data and say, you know what? I think this guy interpreted it, saw this wrong. It really should be like this. Or when new data comes out, you can use that raw data and go. Because interpretation is, is interpretation is flawed, right? There's biases in it. All right. Uh, the, we, what I like to say, especially on the battlefield, okay, when you got the historic record, we're looking at the archaeological record, what's in the ground, what's left behind, especially like on the battlefield. A uh, historic battlefield is what I've done most of my career. Uh, Historic about they have a lot of historic record, which add it gives you a lot of information. Uh, the reason I got into archaeology was because of of prehistory, right? The pre pre contact cultures down here. That's what I really love, and I'm still interested, and I'm still trying to protect the resources in Cameron County. But there's no historic record, so you don't have you have a lot less pictures of the puzzle. A lot of people like to describe doing archaeology as like putting together a jigsaw puzzle with the pictures that you find, the pieces that you find in there. So you have a lot less of that. But the problem with the historic record is, well, you look, you look, you have all the answers. Can I ask you? <laughs> you really do. Uh, uh, sorry. But uh, what's the problem with the historic record, which is the notes? I mean, it's letters from soldiers. It's the reports from the soldiers. Um, it's books that are written after the events. What's one of the big phrases that we say about history? Our, it repeats itself. Okay. History is written by the victors. Okay. So what is the problem with historic record? It's biased. Everything is biased. Everything, everything we write, everything we, is biased. We can't help it. Um, so the archaeological data does not lie. It's there. It's empirical. And that's why we got to use the scientific method to get it out. But it can be misinterpreted. Okay, I better hurry up because we're not we won't leave tonight, right? <laughs> and uh, archaeology is a sub discipline anthropology, which is scientific study of humans. Also, there's all sorts of uh, linguist, uh, physical, uh, physical osteology, all falls that within archaeology. I mean, anthropology, cultural, which I wanted to be a cultural anthropologist first, which is kind of cool, but I don't know how you'd make a living in that without being a professor. All right, this is the real Grand Delta as we define it. So this is the real Grand Delta. I'm glad you smiled. This is the real Grand Delta as we define it as archaeologists. It is all the alluvial deposits. As you get further up in Hidalgo and all that, you start 
we don't have, we have meters upon meters of alluvial deposits, soils, mainly clay, clays, and some sand, very wrong. We do have sand up, up in Cameron County, all the way up there, uh, but not on the surface uh, that much. Uh, but we have layers of it, lenses of it, depend on the flooding events that happen. And the Rio Grande River flood, as you'll see next week when uh, Jude's talking about the hydrology down here, we flooded in history and through, through that all the time, twice a year at least. We had two big seasons of flooding. Uh, one when the snow melts and the hurricanes would flood. The river would always over flood. We depended on that. Okay, we'll start with the paleo Indian period. It goes from 12,000 12, years ago to about 8,000 years ago. That's what we have. Okay, and we define, we put arbitrary labels on periods and all that. They're just archaeologists made up. But those years are pretty good from carbon dating the best we can. It has been pushed back a little bit, maybe to 14, 15,000 years ago. Um, but that's that's at the edge. We don't, you know, that, I haven't, it, it isn't accepted. What's that? Oh, yeah. It's just, it, there's not a lot of a lot of evidence supporting that, but it's it, uh, definitely a possibility. Okay, Paleo Indians, they were down here, and they're known as big game hunters, and we do have mastodons. And in fact, outside of Reynosa, there have been mastodon skeletons found with uh, uh, projectile points in the bone still in there. It's pretty damn cool. We don't think of that for down here. We don't think, yeah, but down here we do have that. Um, I better, maybe they want to see me on, on the people that are home, right? <laughs> these are the paleo Indian points. What's crazy about this, these styles, they're Clovis, Folsom. They're all over North America and South American continent. It just baffles my mind. That's a technology. Okay, so, okay, say you're a hunter and gatherer, right? You're living off the land. What survives? What survives? We do that. You're living in kind of grass, wooden huts. Uh, you're using woven baskets. Um, maybe you got a stone tool to create. It's stone. Stone is about. Stone is the primary thing that survives in the prehistoric world. What's that? Stones? Okay, bones, it depends on the context you're in. If, it, if you're in a cave, actually cave situations, there's great preservation. Actually, corn will survive. A lot of, a lot of material, a rawhide material will survive. In the, in the, it just depends. Out here in Cameron County, forget it. Because we, we have the soil, it's dry and wet, dry and wet. If you're buried in there, dry and wet. And, you know, the bones turn to mush pretty quickly. I mean, well, pretty quickly. Um, and everybody, okay. One, I, got, I wanted to make clear. I was not sitting in the back doing my presentation, okay, earlier today when Barry was talking. I was not doing that, whatever y'all think. <laughs> but I was. Uh, uh, it's just, I think of a, like a large scale of time. I'm always late, too. So, yeah. I say it really quickly, 100 years is pretty quick to me. 100, 254 bones. I've got work historic burials. At the battlefield, they're, they're there. But what you find is teeth. It's like if it's in a bad situation. That, although, well, I'll get to it later. I'm going to hit it myself. But yeah, what is cool here, we have paleo Indians here, the big game hunters. Think of small bands with extremely large uh, ranges, mainly living off of protein. They were collecting some of the fruits and all that, the noises and other stuff you can eat down here, but mainly living off of the protein of large game animals. And we had something. Okay, and then you move to, um, I thought you were going to ask questions, because you didn't. <laughs> if we move to the archaic period, which is about 8,000. Archaic period, and we, okay, so we, based on the material culture, the technology, so it's shifts in technology that we really use that we name these cultures. For the archaic period, we have the use of the atlatl. Before, they just had projectile points on spears, knives, or whatever. Uh, and you saw the picture, they were jabbing it with that. The atlatl is an important, okay, what is the mother of invention? Necessity. Okay, what happened? The damn big animals died off. They hunted them out, or they left, or whatever, the climate changed. They killed off the big animals that were easy to chase and catch and kill. Uh, so you got faster game herds, right? <laughs> you can't run after them and throw a spear and get them. You need this. The atlatl 
significant, significantly increases the velocity of that and gives you a lot more range. It's, it's like an extension of your arm. It's, yeah, it's a big technology advantage of the archaic period. And so what changes? The point. You have smaller, they're not big spearheads. They're smaller. Oh, that's, um, don't ask me to name these. Um, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, about eight to, and we definitely had archaic period. Okay, Cameron County, where do, where do the archaic, where are archaic materials sites? They're deeply buried below. Although when they dug the ship channel out, the ship channel, not the shrimp channel, the ship channel, they and they put the spoil mounds out, there have been archaic points that come out there. But yeah, we're, 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 we have a lot of alluvium, a lot of flooding. Okay, those are Abasolo points. I know that at least. <laughs> Catan, uh, middle archaic. Okay, the middle archaic period. Population explosion all over, all over. And I'm talking generally for te Texas Round in the region, not just the Delta, but the Delta too, and especially up near Zapata. And so I'm using date. And a lot of these, all these points that I'm showing, all the artifacts I'm showing are found locally. I got from, I, got from, I didn't find them. I, I've used collections from local collectors and all that to, to make these points, uh, to make these slides. And they're actually, they're kind of old. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say this. Karen and I were SCA AmeriCorps members in 96. She was in 95, 96 at Palo Alto Battlefield. That's when I used these and made these slides. So they're old. I should update it, right? <laughs> well, those don't change. This is the most important in the middle arcade. The, the shoreline and the modern estuary systems stabilized. So that we got a lot of population growing and all that going. And that, because it's a huge resource of food. But you also have a diversity of honey. You got everything, everything, lizards, everything you eat now, rabbits, um, snakes, whatever you can eat. And then the other thing that comes out during the archaic period, stone pipe for smoking. So you got leisure activities coming out, which you didn't see before. I don't know. Um, I don't know what, what's that? <laughs> Whatever they can get their hands on. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, okay. It's it's hard to say. There has been some studies and all that. Okay, the lichen. You know what the lichen is on mesquite trees? Some of that and some of the different other other stuff. They weren't smoking marijuana, I don't think. I don't know. But um, <laughs> I can't be sure of that. But yeah, but that's kind of cool. So it's showing you got that uh, um, leisure activities coming in. And I know I'm going way too slow for the you know, over. We can start by we can start before we get to the historic period, and we can do this separately on a Saturday or something. Um, late archaic point, it shifted. It's going okay. So middle archaic was huge population explosion. What happened? This repeats itself. His, Karen was saying history repeats itself over time, and I think we cultures, every damn culture, every society I can ever think of, even ours as it rises and falls, and you abandon, you overuse your resources, you overextend yourself, you overpopulate the areas, you run out of resources. That's a big lesson that we never learn. We don't, and technology cannot kill mother nature. Mother nature wins every time. <laughs> so yeah, so we go that, so we will kind of go. And so you get shifts, you get this, so they, it's technology shifts. What was the, the first one was the atolatum during the archaic? Okay, now it's getting harder to hunt because they're out hunting the herds and all that. They invent the bow and arrow. Necessity is the mother of adventure because you need faster, stronger, farther, farther going weapons to kill your herd. You're getting birds and all that. You're eating more variety of animals now because protein's getting harder and harder to come by and protein is very important to human existence. And so is gathering. These are just, those are star points. Those are other ones are Cameron points. Uh, these. Okay, what's the other thing in Cameron? What's the thing in Camry that, Cameron County that we don't have naturally here? Water. No, we got a lot of water. It's just salty. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. Uh, 
we, we don't have rocks. If you see any rocks here in Cameron County, they're cultural material because they're brought in by man. There's not one single rock you'll see on the surface that's natural. I put my name on that, okay? Because we have all these flood alluvial deposits. The cobbles that they come up, so these guys, and they have a, bless you. Bless you, okay. You know what I'm sorry. Uh, I was gonna say, um, hey, y'all do know I'm your classmate, right? I find I've been teaching this for years. I'm actually taking this. I'm actually gonna be a master naturalist now. Okay, yeah, we don't. So a lot of the times, most at the archaeological sites, you see finished pools of stone. You don't see woodwork like other sites. Okay, and that's why a lot of archaeology, and that's why the next. I just left the Park Service after 25 years. The next phase of my career, I'm trying to tap into resources here in Cameron, in the Valley, Cameron County, Hidalgo, Star, all that, because we have archaeologists that come down from other parts of the state, come down from West Virginia, like the Garcia Pasture site at the, at the, where the Texas LNG is slated to go. That is one of the most important sites we have. Have any of y'all heard of A.E. Anderson? Darren, you better say yes. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Anybody else? Okay. A.E. Anderson was uh, the county engineer in Cameron County from 1920 to 1940. He systematically collected archaeological sites, although I hate collectors. A. Anderson's okay. Uh, but yeah, he is the foundation of our knowledge on the prehistory. He systematically here and also in, on, the, on the south side of the river. His collection is up at the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory, which is part of the University of Texas Austin uh, facilities. And that is the foundation. The Garcia Pasture site, which is where Texas LNG is supposed to go, is probably the most, has the most dominance of artifacts out there within it. It has a shell working area. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go on. <laughs> okay, the three traits of the Browns of Complex, which is what archaeologists call the late prehistoric uh, complex associated with the Browns. There are three traits that separate it uh, from uh, any other hunter and gathering cultures around at the period. Like I said, other archaeologists come down, they say, ah, there's nothing here. It's not because the sites are very ephemeral, because one, we don't have rock. Uh, and the other for artifacts, they don't necessarily recognize. Okay, up in Central Texas, they have these huge bird rock minutes, which they use for cooking. You know what we use down here? And I say we, because where I am, <laughs> is clay, clay balls. We find clay balls in archaeological context that would heat up, you know, if you've never seen one or didn't, weren't expecting something like that, as an archaeologist, how easy it would be to skip over these sites or blow off these sites. And that's what's happened over the years. And that's what we're trying to stop. And that's what's happened to the Garcia pasture site. The LNG, but that, uh, that's, I can't do anything about that, at least not yet. Um, they had a sophisticated shell work in this. That's one of the first traits. Because where are we at? We're on the coast. They had, that was their resource. The resource they had, the water they had, shell. It survives. It's like stone almost. It's really, it really can survive a lot of weathering and all that. It doesn't, it doesn't decay fast at all. Okay. Evidence of trade with Mesoamerica. So, although a lot of the, uh, that is amazing how connected the prehistoric cultures were from the Mississippi culture in, in Mississippi, Alabama. Uh, to the southwest, down with Mesoamerica. Oh, it's just amazing how many there are ties in between. It just baffles my brain. And they had distinct cemetery sites, which is unusual for hunter and gatherers, right? And very low, you know, they got to be very mobile. You aren't caring, you know. Just imagine you're homeless. That's kind of like hunter and gatherers. You have, you can't have a lot of a lot of stuff to take around. I say that I can say that because I've been homeless before. <laughs> uh, I think I say okay. This is one of the major shells that they use. One of the major shells used. It's a whelk, the conch whelk shell. All that uses all the parts. They use this, the columella, the shaft. This is like they they shaft it on the reeds and stuff, and use it for gigging flounder and stuff and other things. Okay. I wasn't there. That's the best of my, that's the best based on what we find. We, there's a lot of holes in the puzzle, the prehistoric. And the more sites get destroyed by, by 
the develop, especially the industrial and development of this, which aren't properly studied. Like I say, oh, that site's not worth anything, and they don't have to do uh, mitigation, which is like, which is that's what the National Historic Preservation. Okay, we make our living as archaeologists by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. It's not like anything with federal money has to do comply. They have to look at what the impacts to the cultural resources are. And when people come down here, like the LNGs, because they get a FERC permit, or somebody has to issue an FA permit to some something <laughs> down here in Cameron County, um, if you don't, if you get people that come and say, ah, there's nothing, aren't familiar with the resources, they're going to blow them off in that because they're ephemeral. They are very ephemeral. But that's all we got, and it's important, and it's unique. It is special. Not because of that. Because of this, no. Because these are dang, these are also for the goat. These are dang, they're ornaments. These were the trade items, the ornaments from the shell, were what they were using for trade. They have all sorts, and you'll see something in a minute. This is the, the thing. Okay, with little stones, they cut, that's a cut and groove, a groove and, no, cut, yeah, cut and groove, and snap, whatever. I forget, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the name of it. But yeah, they get a little stone, they wear down, wear down a little groove in there, they snap it. That's how you know it's a cultural, and it's old. That's just, you gotta look for signs, because you'll see a bunch of shell fragments out there. You gotta start looking for evidence that it's worked. It's obviously worked because the edge is on it. Those are little awls or something, tools, could be ornaments. They call it hooks, but it, it's more of an awl of anything for punching leather uh, or that, punching hides. Yeah. These are shell shell disc beads all around okay these guys warm every culture warm you've seen like some movies or whatever like uh i can't even think of one now what's the what's the one um apocalypse yeah apocalypse, like, uh, yeah you, all these guys are wearing stuff all around so, the ornament they're highly ornamented not well clothed not well dressed but highly ornamented <laughs> these the gorgets they'd have you see a lot of these this one came from a barrel the floor floyd moore site I was dug here in the 40s by, uh, by an old UT archaeologist. Tinklers, the Oliva shell tinklers. There's these Oliva shell, here's the, the natural ones, and they'd have a coyote tooth that was punched. And uh, that, I have a friend, Don, the ones that I took these pictures from, uh, he, he makes them himself too. You know, like, yeah. But then their age, you can tell what's a, what's a real artifact or not by the age and weathering. Okay, one thing I forgot to put a picture in, which I had one. There's another thing that gives uh, evidence that it's an archaeological site. You're supposed to find like three different materials or something like that when you're to be document a site. Fish otoliths. You know what those are? They're the bone. They're the only bone of a fish that's going to survive hundreds of years. And they're usually gold. I wish I would have put them up. Um, they're usually turned golden, but with the sun, with exposure. If you find one of those, a golden little autolith, and, and you can tell the difference between a uh, uh, drum trout, uh, black drum, they're all, they're all different shapes. So it's pretty cool. So you can see what they're eating, though. Know. But if it's golden brown, it is an archaeological site, pretty much. Um, that. Dulcinea, scrapers. You can see the wear. These are artifacts. You can see the wear on those from scraping fish, scales, hides. Cleaning that. This was a heavily used tool. And these are some of the raw materials. These aren't these aren't artifacts. Uh, they're just picked up as representative samples. The the cockle. <laughs> the, uh, there's a cartoon that uses that name. I forgot it. Everybody knows it can say it. The big the quay hog. I forgot what cartoon it is. I want to say yeah, uh, Homer Simpson maybe. Okay, and the pumice shell. All those all wash up with the how much are used for, for scraping and grinding um, that? Okay, so their connection with Mesoamerica was through Azteca, second region which connected down to that. And like I said, it was the ornaments, the ornaments. And why do we know is Huastecan? Because of the ceramic types that they have that are in the collection. It's not just these that, okay, their drawings like this for the Anderson collection, the big Oyas, these are the drawings are because every culture has its own unique style. For the members, 
to the to the to the Mississippian cultures. Everybody has, has their own unique style. So this is specifically the Huasteca. It's not Mesoamerican, it's Huasteca. But some of the other stuff they have is from Mesoamerica. And the, yeah, there's that different styles in there. These are Huasteca. So they traded and got these bowls. They didn't make it. They did make some ceramics, which is also very unusual for hunter and gatherers. Because what did I say? It's like you got to be light. You got to be very light to pack up and move and travel around. Okay, so I said the the patios were small bands with huge ranges. During the Middle Archaic, there were uh, big bands of small ranges. Because, yeah, they had all there. They were getting resources. And that's why they depleted the resources. During this period, they're back to a lot of small bands, not necessarily big ranges, but they, they work together. You hear a lot of tribe, like when the Spanish came here, and they documented a lot of different tribe names and all that. It's hard to say. And that's, that's what these guys call themselves, and there's still some people out there. There's a tribe that call themselves the Como Cruda. They're not federally recognized, but they're here, and, they, and they're, that, they're putting up a fight for the Garcia Pasture site and against SpaceX and all that. So, that's cool because they feel this is their land. And they, yeah. But what did I bring that? Um, Got to be, oh, there's a lot of bats. They're big bats. So, there, yeah, there's all the Comacruda, all these different names of these tribes that the Spanish recorded and documented that are in the historic record and now in books. Um, but they would get together. They're seasonally. They different had, so they were kind of connected in some way. And the uh, Comacruda tribe hate being called Kawatekans. That's what we've called them for years because of a linguistic style. But they don't like being called that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I won't say anything. All right. Then we got obsidian. Y'all know what obsidian is? It's a volcanic rock. Um, they use it for scalpel. It is very sharp. It's like glass. It is a fastly cooled like volcanic rock. So it's like glass. It's called okay. So the church, the other artifacts, the stone artifacts I've showed, those are all church. It's a siliceous gravel that's formed, and it's you con it has conchoidal fracturing. And you sharpen the edges by taking these little flakes off, right? By working the tools and making it like a biface. It's amazing how much sharper an obsidian, because it's like glass, it's like that. And you know what the Garcia pasture has? It has a glass point, late prehistoric glass point there. Pretty damn cool. Garcia is, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, as you can tell, I do care about the Garcia pasture. And not because my name's Garcia, because it's not. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Tate I. This is something else. Okay, this is an art artifact, but it, it's just uh, something I got off the internet because the jadeites are up there in in um, Carl, uh, and they're not. They're hard. To, they are. It's a very unusual stone to be up here. It's ornamental. And, and okay, all the most okay, all the ceramics, all the cool. It's all found in burial context. This is uh, serpentine. Yeah, I've never seen that natural, but. So the cemetery sites up on the Arroyo, Colorado, um, on the North Banks. It, okay, Arroyo, Colorado has been okay. This is just late prehistoric, so it's only twelve hundred years ago. It's about no eight. I say that right. Twelve hundred years ago to contact. Yeah, twelve hundred years to contact. Um, I've gotten into arguments with your next teacher, Jude, about this when this was the main channel. Right, I it, it had to be a main channel at some point, uh, maybe not. I don't know. It is a Yazoo, it definitely turned into a Yazoo uh distributor. Y'all know what a Yazoo is? It's like a drainage valve for big rivers like the Mississippi and all that. The Nile, they all have these kind of that where it's just when they flood, they're gonna need this. And that's what it is. Definitely serves as that now. But you can see if you look at the delta, it's a projecting lobe a lot like the Nile. Who, who was that last week? Uh, yeah, that did. Yeah, I forgot. Who was that? <laughs> I guess I would be bad on, on my question, answering those questions. Okay. Yeah. So, all that. These started to bury in the 40s. Y'all hear of Green Jay Park? Y'all know about Green Jay Park in McAllen? Okay. I got to talk to the city commission because B is right next to that. There are other burials right there in Green Jay Park. The problem is they were dug in the, 40, in the 40s and 60s. And the maps were, yeah, it was we were we were fighting on, well, not fighting, but me and some of the archaeologists from UTRGV 
trying to put and, and up at the Texas Store Commission, get an accurate, I couldn't say 100% it was right on that property. It was really close, but there were cemetery sites all over that. There were burials. There were more, okay, that one site had more than one burial. This is the way prehistoric burials look. Um, flexed, they're buried in a flex position. This is Floyd Moore site, dug uh, early 60s, I'd say, judging by the chalk used. You know. <laughs> These are the artifacts found in that burial. The beads, everything you see, the coyotes, uh, bone button, little shells, so all ornamental shells. Uh, a hunter in January of 1992, a hunter saw an exposed at, at Bahia Grande, uh, part of the part of the bluff of, of, of one of the lakes. It wasn't the main one, but it was one of there. Had slumped off and exposed a human burial. And just so you can see the skull. I wish I had a picture, but uh, I did take pictures, but I don't have. I didn't have any where I have now. Uh, I couldn't get it anyway. And it's probably wrong to put it, but yeah, it slumped off. So I looked at it, identified that it was prehistoric, although there wasn't any artifacts with it. And they just covered it up as NACRA and that you, con you consult with a native tribe. Okay, so I mentioned federally recognized tribe. So when you're federal government, you only, can, you only deal with federally recognized. So the only tribe that really corresponds, because I, I did a lot of compliance when I worked at Palo Alto, you send it to Alabama, the Mescalero Apaches in New Mexico are the only people who have responded. It's okay. The one who usually Holly Hooten, she's also an archaeologist, studied at Michigan. So she, uh, I worked in New Mexico when I first started my career, and the native groups really don't like uh, white archaeologists. Not that I'm white, but yeah, they don't. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, yeah, there's the barrel. So that's around the barrel. That was after the barrel we got together. Uh, <laughs> Emily's over there on the right. She's with the Texas Historic Commission. She's a the second to the state archaeologist. Uh, that's uh, George McDonald, who is the regional archaeologist for Fish and Wildlife. Uh, that's Mark Spear pointing with his finger. That's the former superintendent of Palo Alto Battlefield. Jack Keller, he is the senior archaeologist of Cameron County. Um, uh, I always like to say until Jack moved here, now I'm the best archaeologist in Cameron County. So I was the only one for a while, but Jack moved here and now I'm not. So. <laughs> And there's Lee, and then two of my interns came out. So they, they got to see a, a burial out there. They were UTRGV. They were ecological restoration students uh, with Dr. Piero. And so they came out. Bahia Grande, Bahia Grande. Just the, that was, okay, that was March or April of 92, but the barrel we, the barrel I dealt with was in January. But they were, they were my uh, students since the all semester. So they came out, my interns, yeah. Well, so they got to see, well, one of them got to help me dig, the other one couldn't because she, she had a commitment that day. Well, not dig, it just spoke. But okay, what he's pointing at is this. Do y'all see those? Those are those circular disc beads. It's there. So, that day definitely made it so, these sites would be so easy. Because I did contract, by the beginning of my career, I did contract archaeology, New Mexico, uh, down to the southeast all over Texas, Indiana, all over Texas. You traveling around regions, going there, you're young, usually most shovel bums are 20s, 30s, best, you know, and yeah, you travel around, you know some, you don't, yeah, you're not focused on one area like like I've been able to do now with my career, which started in 1990. So you come in, I would, it would be so easy for a crew of archeologists to come down and one, walk over those, or two, just think, ah, oh, it's, it's not it's not a site because there's only there's only this one type. Hey, look, okay, George McDonald, his beginner's look, his first time down here, right? His first time to to the valley. He gets a damn point in ten minutes. <laughs> but that's okay. George is cool. Uh, uh, I'll say this: all archaeologists are cool. No, no, no. There's some. There's some. I won't even say the word. <laughs> Okay, then we go to the Colonial Pier. What time is it, anyway? Oh, okay, we got time. I might be able to finish this on time. I doubt, but yeah. Okay, the Colonial Period, right? There were something dead. Mid-18th century, 1740s, 1750s, in there, Spanish Gulf. Okay, there, have y'all heard of the Pineda Stone? 
supposedly 15, 19. Oh, I can't even think of it. Oh, <laughs> I know who, Javi is the one who, Javier, uh, not Javi Gonzalez, but Javier De Leon is the one who talked about the Figueroa stone last week and all that. Yeah, so that, there's a document. I don't know. People say they've seen it, like it's in there, yeah, but I've never seen it. So I don't know it's here. That he was here, but he mapped in and because there's a dispute if he was here. Um, what's the river in, in uh, Tamaulipas that, that goes out near Tampico? Anyway, there's another river that could be over there that has a lot of palms too. Anyway, that doesn't matter. This area, this settlement actually happened here. We know that for a fact because we're here. <laughs> okay, and this is other maps. We have a, this is part of the historic record that we now have. Before, the native groups didn't make any maps. We don't have any of this documentation until the Spanish started coming here and naming the, naming the tribes and all that. Okay, in 1845, I'll jump up a little bit. Um, something happened in... in Something happened that would uh, have an impact on all of us, right? Texas decided to become a state that summer. They voted to be sure. Okay, 1836, what happened? We'll see how, uh, okay, what happened? Uh, I'll just, I'll start with the ending of that. Okay, after, after General Santana stormed and wiped out the Alamo and Goliath, he was defeated at the Battle of San Jacinto, right? And... They signed a treaty of, of Velasco, in which the Texans claimed one that was their republic and that the uh, Rio Grande River and not the Oasis. During the colonial time, during during the Mexican Republic time, Texas has always been the southern boundary of Texas has always been the Oasis River. As you can see, that that huge area was the disputed territory. Okay, the Treaty of Velasco was never ratified. It wasn't a valid treaty. Santa Ana was a captive when he when he signed it. The the Congress of Mexico never signed it, so it's not ratified, not valid. But anyway, Mexico could not stop Texas. A lot of people say this area was uninhabited. That's BS. We have all these land grants here. People here. Okay, the the main cities were on the south side of the river. But there are ranches and houses all on the north pasture land. And the people own this territory and people here. Okay, what happens? Say you go up 281 and you're going like to Duval County or so. What 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 is significant about that area? I know Danny goes there a lot. What is significant about that area? What is there not a lot of? Besides people, <laughs> there's not a lot of water. Water is precious, right? Water, you need water to live. You need protein, you need water. You can survive longer without protein than you can without water. Um, and so it's all important. Yeah, it's the brush land. It's a ranch land. There's not a lot of people there because there wasn't never a lot of people there because of water. And that's right. That was a result, but a mess. But it's still very valuable land, and it still belonged to people back then. Okay, that's enough of that. But anyway, so... 1845, uh, that, Texas War. President Polk uh, said, yeah, he guaranteed, they become a, they become a state of the Union. Um, he guaranteed the Rio Grande River would be the bounty. Okay, oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I never thought, okay. What, what, did I, what was the last thing I said, Karen? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> guaranteed the boundary. Yeah, the public. Anyway, so let me just go on to the next slide. <laughs> I love my greatest line. Okay. So to protect that, let me go back. Uh, I still don't know what I was going to say. Okay. So that summer, President Paul, oh, now I know what I was going to say. Okay. President Polk was a one-term president. His main thing, his main problem, he only had one plank, whatever you call it, I hate politics. He had only one plank. It was westward expansion. Using the phrase manifest destiny came out by some reporter, manifest destiny. He saw this as a big chunk. Okay, when he was a senator, Polk would try and negotiate the exchange of Texas with Mexico, but Mexico 
that didn't want. They let, and this was such a stupid plan, I'll just say this. It's such a stupid plan. They wanted to populate Texas from, from U.S. encroachment. Who did they get to populate? U.S. citizens. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like, come on, can't you, can't you see the, this unlogic in that, the lack of logic in that? Yeah. Okay. So that's all part of it. Anyway, it's too much to talk about there. So President Polk sent General Zachary Taylor and half the standing army uh, that summer to Corpus, to the top of the disputed terri territory as the Army of Observation. They went there. There was, uh, Slidell went down to Mexico City to try and negotiate peace. He sent the army there as kind of a show of force to, hey, come on, we're going to beat you up if you don't talk, right? If you don't give us what we want. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. In the spring of 1846, after failed negotiations, the spring of 1846, um, he sent Polk, uh, General Zachary Taylor with down to the banks of the Rio Grande as the army of occupation. I mean, op occupation. Okay. Half the standing army was only 5,000 troops back at that time. Um, so we got it. This, in March of 1846, um, the one deep water ch channel, which uh, who said that? Tony said it last time. Yeah, the natural pass th th was there. It was utilized by the ships. They set up, uh, and Port Isabel was a, it was called something else, Punta de Isabella, Porton de Punta de Isabel. It was a fishing village, all that. Los Fresnos was a village here in, in, when the soldiers came in 1846. You know what Brownsville was? Nothing. <laughs> I, I love Brownsville from Brownsville, okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, so they, they set up at the fishing village of Portisville, they set up a depot, a fort, to start gathering supplies because they were gathering supplies. The whole time where they were there, they started construction on an earthen fortification. Um, and I'm sorry, the lettering in white is bad. I, can't, I can barely see it. Okay, that's the city of Matamoros down there, right there across the banks from the city of Matamoros. So they started construction on April the 25th. I have no idea what the next slide is. So I'll tell a lot of the story here. Okay, April the 25th, a scouting party of dragoons. Okay, okay, meanwhile, when they crossed the Nueces River, Mexico considered that an act of war, which you, which it obviously was, right? They crossed the Nueces River into Mexican territory, in Mexico mines, undisputed. Yeah, so that's the war. So they were already amassing an army in the north. In early April, they sent General Mariano Arista to take command of the troops of the north, of the army of the north. On April 25th, a scouting party of like 45 dragoons was taken, uh, was overtaken by a regiment of Mexican uh, cavalry over their Caracitos, uh, which is, we were doing some archaeology back in 97 looking for it. I think I know where to go, but I got to get access now. Because uh, there, there was a stone monument put in 1870 where the where spot. And we don't, we don't have a great, uh, there, there's, that stone, there's a marker in a canyon. If you pass uh, Los Indios Bridge and you just go that where Galveston ranches, there's a canyon. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah, no, I won't. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll just say this. Okay, in 1916, the commander of Fort Brown, uh, this is why I'm skipping around. The commander of Fort Brown put four cannons to mark the sites of the battles to follow also. So anyway, yeah, I got ahead of myself. Anyway, I'll stop that. Okay, they did overtake it. So that's what Paul Q, okay, once that happened, what they, they killed seven, Karen, Karen will probably tell you more accurate numbers. They killed seven and took 40 or so, about to held them as prisoners of war in Matamoros, right? That's when, that's what Taylor used to get back to Polk to declare war on Mexico. So that happened April 20th, uh, May 1st, uh, uh, Taylor, went back to the fort. He left Major Jacob Brown and 500 troops to finish construction on the fort because the back end of the fort, this end of the fort, oh, there's a wire there. <laughs> Where's the point? There's a pointer here too, right? I probably broke it when I threw it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the back end of the fort, they started construction over there. It's a, a star fort, earth fortification. It wasn't finished. So Taylor left. But yeah, once they had prisoner of war, urgency was there. Urgently, and they'd been massing troops for months over there in Matamoros. On May the 3rd, the Mexican army started shelling the fort. Um, meanwhile, Taylor starts heading back 
to go relieve the fort with 300 wagon trains uh, of supplies to, to withstand a lengthy siege on May the 3rd, on May the 7th, I mean, he was intercepted at Palo Alto. By the Palo Alto. Anyway, there are a lot of period lithographs out about. This is the one that looks how you, not so surreal as a lot of the other ones. This is probably an accurate depiction. And you know what I really like about this? It's so bleached out on top, you don't see the mounds. Because <laughs> there, are, there are mounds in this picture, which I, that's what I usually say. It's the wrong thing that's always wrong about. It. But that's what it would look like. Palo Alto was an open prairie on the road. Palo Alto, what does that mean, Karen? Tall timber. Do we have tall timber, sir? Yes. <laughs> when you're coming from the coast and there ain't nothing, <laughs> you know, first trees you see, you stand up on the horizons. <laughs> Yeah, it was a watering hole, and there were trees around there. Yeah, so uh, so that's why I get the name. And it was a watering hole well before the Battle of Palo Alto, known as Palo, because that was the road to Matamoros from Port from the fishing village of Port Isabel. Why do you think? Why do you think it went all the way around there? It was a good question for last week, because and the maps. I'll sh I don't even know when the next map I have that on. Because what's at the Bahia Grande, the ship channel, they dug the ship channel through all the estuaries. So it was all wet, marsh, coastal land. This was the first dry land. You come out on Highway 100 and you cut through Palo Alto. Okay. Uh, uh, that's a, a story for another presentation. <laughs> what time is it? 840? Okay, thank you. We're screwed now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so map, historic record, go that. I, I'll go quick now. Uh, it turned into artillery duel. It's artillery duel. Mexican had superior numbers. Uh, Americans had supply. Okay, there's a myth, and I hate it. It's still repeated in the video at Palo Alto that Mexican army only fired solid cannonball, solid copper cannonball. That's BS too. We definitely found Mexican army had the same ammunition, artillery ammunition as the U.S. Army, the exact same, except some were made of copper. Okay, the U.S. was all iron. Nothing but iron. Every anything uh, the Mexican had copper and used lead for some of the shrapnel. Well, actually, both sides that had the spherical case shot, which are exploding, uh, exploding hollowed out cannonballs with powder, and they used they were using a like a wick, like a cotton wick uh, that was treated with um, what is the word? Anyway, it's treated with this. Um, material like a liquid or whatever, and so it's slow burn, so you can get slow control how long it burns. So they cut it for how many seconds they wanted it to burn. It shoot up, and when you when you fire the cannon, the flames would go around. They'd light it, and the idea was it for it to to explode up in the air and 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 down. I'll show you one. There should be one in there. I don't know, I'm all over the place with this. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting my help. But anyway, they all had the same our ammunition there. You will get to see artifacts. This is that. Okay. This is something I put. Okay, the flags. This, the flags are in the wrong position, and that's my fault because damn Doug Murphy wanted to put up the flags. Now, we had just barely done one field of archaeology, one field season of it. We, we did six field seasons out there. We got a really good data. Actually, we, the technical report looks like it's going to be turned into a, a text to AM press book. It's so exciting. But yeah, it's something like that. We have it based on sort map. But based on the archaeology, it should all be shifted uh, kind of like that, like 15 degrees up. Which is cool to be able to tell that. Yeah, a little bit more than that. Okay, that's the final line. The final line, it should almost be north-south, the final battle line. But the, the initial line should be kind of like that. But it's so cool. Okay, maps. So, yeah, <laughs> what does that look like over there? Uh, it looks like ship channel to me, but it's a ridge. But yeah, so a lot of the time, it's, there's no ridge like that. Loma Alta, y'all familiar with Loma Alta Lake and all that? A lot of people, so, and you'll see it, let me see. Yeah, Paul, there's Loma Alta, there's a ridge. That's why the NHL boundary and the state site boundary goes way over there. That map, okay, and also, during the beginning of the 20th century, uh, right before World War I, the artillery from Fort Brown would fire using that artillery rate. And so there's these shrapnel balls, about 40, they look like little lead ball, not musket balls to me, because the musket balls used during this period, they're larger. Uh, but other people confuse them as musket balls from the battle. 
So they move the battle out that way, which is good and bad. It's good because you get more protection, although uh, as proven by recent history, not, uh, not everybody gives a shit about archaeology. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, this is in the battle. I got to go around this way. I got to come around. Um, and I am wearing shoes, guys. Uh, this is the battle line. This is still a private end holding, which is sad that we don't have it yet. We've been buying land since 1998. Okay, the park was originally established in 90, in 78 with just 50 acres right around here with the corner where, where they had moved the cannon. In nine, they did a boundary study, and in 19... Jesus, <laughs> 93 uh, or 92, 1992, the Palo, the National Palo Alto Modified Society of 1992 created this 3,400 acre boundary that you see in red. Um, right now, they own most of this. I think they, yeah, they own most of this. This big large fee, which is a 1,400 in holding, is still there. And that holds the eastern end of the battlefield. The battlefield, the Mexican army was stretched from here to about here. And yeah, stretch over a mile long, and they're anticipating when they intercepted the road. Okay, so road, I don't have a pointer. The road comes in here, and man, you can see it in some of the aerials, especially the older ones. You can see the road, Andy. Came in here. There was an old inn, an old inn that was built 1848, and it was, it, it was evacuated in 1853 because they moved old Fort Isabel Road to the east in 1853 to where it is currently. An old Fort Isabel Road, which is up here. Um, anyway, that has no importance of anything. Okay, <laughs> okay. I like this idea. Okay, so to do survey, this is what the battlefield looked like, right? Um, what's okay? There's a lot of man, in, human, anthropogenic influences here. It wouldn't have quite looked like that in 1846, right? Okay, one, prickly pear. On a coastal prairie, prickly pear wouldn't be out there like that. It'd be on the little rises. Two, that's a prairie. You have trees growing out there. Anybody want to guess why? Cattle's a good answer. But humans, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, what was Barry saying? That it floods? What did I say earlier? It floods all the time? We flood. We're Delta. We're supposed to flood, but humans try to con, try to overpower Mother Nature. They build all these drainage. In 1914 and 19, 1912, 1914, they started this huge Cameron, Willisey, and Hidalgo County started this huge network of drainage ditches and all that. It started back then. The hydrology's changed. The hydrology changed. This area, the floodplain doesn't flood like it used to. So we get woody vegetation growing up where it should be coastal prairie. And then you get Farmers are people who tear up the corn. Okay, that soil is not good for crop cultivation. Okay, so what do some farmers do? They plow it up <laughs> and uh, they collect subsidies for not planting. Um, and then they leave it open and they let collectors go on. Okay, if you don't know, I hate collectors. I don't hate collectors. I do, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's going to be a question, right? Does Rolando like or hate collectors, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. So they left it open. A lot of people, the battle, okay. We did, so let me just go through artifacts. It's getting late. Okay, so I divide. You can't see that either. It's all bleached out. Uh, I divided the, the park into a 200-meter grid system so we could go in and checkerboard it, right? Checkerboard it. and get Because I, I had no money at first. The first few years I did on, on park budget, I would I would partner with people. That guy, the big guy with the ball head, not facing us, is was my old boss in Florida at the Southeast Archaeological Center. He taught me how to be a battlefield archaeologist. Uh, he would come, I partner with him. And I partnered with uh, the cultural resource people, cultural G, cultural resource GIS people in Washington. They would come down. Uh, all we had to do is pay their travel, and we get volunteers. Robert, you see that guy? He's an effing collector. No, he, he's a good friend of mine. He is, but he is a collector. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, but Robert, yeah, he's cool. They're collecting. Uh, we use so, uh, this methodology was started in the 80s by Doug Scott, who's a good friend of mine, a mentor of mine, at the Battle of Little Bighorn. There's a, a big fire at the Battle of Little Bighorn. He developed this methodology. We were still 
rely on for doing battlefield archaeology using metal detectors and okay um anything experience experience is golden so if you use a damn machine swing it every weekend for your hobby and all that you become pretty damn good at it right an archaeologist that's one of our tools that we really weren't using much i've got i've gotten much better so it's easier or better to get people that use it more familiar the problem is you know yeah there's problems with that yeah <laughs> but i'll just leave it at that but anyway we did that we systematically get a blade we had it in 200 meter grid we checkerboard it we cleared the thing uh we cleared it out the best because you want a smooth fat surface so you can swing the head of the metal detector like that you don't have to hunch over i do but yeah you don't have to yeah Sorry, uh, clear, get it, artifacts. Look, I use UTBA, the Anthropology Club students. That girl, both of them are still archaeologists. That girl, Robin, is a PhD, uh, underwater archaeologist. It's cool. From you know what? <clears throat> I got to give a shout out to Russ Skronik. He came down here in 2007. He's a U uh, at UT Pan American. Before that, the archaeologists they had at UT Pan American, Pazorkis, which I love, they're great people, but they're South American archaeologists. So all the students who went to school down here would go there. Russ brought the students to study our heritage, our here, our region. He did a great, he had a chaps. Have any of y'all heard of chaps? They did the Civil War Trail. They just did something called the Ancient Landscapes. Somebody was talking about it to go see it. Um, I forgot where it's at, but it's traveling around. So probably, it is damn good. Or is it? Chaps. These people, they, I'm so proud. I'm so glad that Russ would, came down here because he made a difference. That's what anyone could hope to do to be accessible, to make a difference. All you can ask for. I can make y'all late. I know I can make that difference. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's Charles Hecker. He did the work here on uh, in 92 when this was first I'm sorry, when this was first established, he came down before we had any land. He did the work getting land over permission in school. He's also a really good friend of mine, a mentor. That's Drew. <laughs> he found a lead shot. That's Steve. You got to watch out with Steve. It's a good thing he doesn't come down here anymore. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> God, no, I just lost her name. It's not Haley, it's somebody else. Yeah, Anna. Anna, she wasn't, she worked with SEAC a little. Drew and Steve worked a little longer. Okay, so we do that. We have people going down. Charles and our colleagues, we have. We have people falling around with bags and tags. Each of them have a, a, a log where they collect the record. We get, um, we get the GPS, we, they pick up the artifact, they get a number, and they put a pin flag down to the ground with their, so like Anna would be A, A1, 3A, whatever, the trouble, to, I mean, uh, uh, MDET, MDET unit, MDET fine. Okay, and then Steve would be S, one, three, so we have them each collecting that, let's see. And then these guys, that's cultural resource, that's David Lowe, military historian, working with the cultural resource guys. We could get, man, now the equipment is so much. We were happy to get 30 centimeter accuracy. Now you're, you're angry if you don't get 10 centimeter accuracy with stuff. Uh, GPS is really, all the technology is really expanded. And so at the end of the day, we come in, that's Jessica. <laughs> I think that's Manuel in the right there. Um, Come in, you spread out all the different bags, all the bags spread up, so we combine them into one FS lock. And we do this at the end of every day. We have to do it because it'd be too much to stockpile. about. Because what happens? What happens when you work? What happens when you do anything, Karen? No. <laughs> you make mistakes. People, you make, uh, I know it's for you, it piles up, not for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but you make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And so it's easier to count. If we waited till the end of the project, you know how hard it would be to go that throughout the day. So there were several, there would always be a couple of items that didn't get GPS. And the other thing we do, we put the pin flag, we bend the pin flag onto the GPS. So it's kind of easier to find out there. But yeah, we, mistakes are always made, and that's just part of life. Um, yeah. That used to be my office there. Okay, now you can see the grid symbol. It still is white, but, but I have it colored to what years we did it. We did it at six field seasons. We eventually covered the whole thing. I know we're going late. This is, you can't see that shit. So it's just a database of all the artifacts that has the coordinates in it. But let's get to the cool stuff, right? Okay. That's how many artifacts we found. <laughs> Over 3,000. Okay. I didn't say this earlier, but I thought I did, but I might not have. But it had been collected for years, right? People find, they plow, they let people come collect. Okay. That is 
what 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 I don't like about collectors uh, is that they grip holes in the historic record. I said it's like a jigsaw puzzle. They're fucking taking out pieces. I'm sorry. They're taking out pieces of the jigsaw puzzle like it's nothing. They're taking so you got so what happens when you come to scientific study something? You don't know what's missing, right? When you don't have something that's there, you don't know it's not there. And so I say, okay, but here I know it's not there because what do you think they took? What do you think they kept? <laughs> All the one we didn't find any musket parts, which we should have. We should have found barrels because they're big and obvious and easy to find with a metal detector. Yeah, so we, yeah, we, we did. Uh, we found a hilt. That was about it. Uh, uh, they high graded. Okay, they would quit collecting once you get a solid iron cannonball or iron copy. They quit. They would leave. So we found a, the artillery munitions is mainly what we found. We did find buds and all that, but all the brass, all the stuff that was valuable to them, uh, was had a huge. Uh, what do you say? There's a dearth of those artifacts. Yeah. They, there should have been a lot more of those artifacts if the record was untouched. We would have expected just based upon the battle, but based upon the historic record. But yeah, so that's what damage collectors do. National level, they're okay. Some of them, at least. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that we collected. That's we're using Charlie's data from '92 and all that. Okay, that's what the database was showing. We put it all in, in that. We have UTM coordinates. Okay, archaeologists, we're real scientists. We use the metric system and the UTM. So yeah. <laughs> We are scientists, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so if they don't do that, we can do so much manipulation in that with, with that, even software. Okay, this is a copper cannonball. It's four pounder. But they had a lot. They also had iron four pound cannonball. Okay, that was the other beautiful thing about this battle. <laughs> the Mexican army had four and eight pound cannon cannon. That's the way they, they gauged the cannon instead of like a 30 odd six or whatever. They weighed by the weight of a solid cannonball. It was a four pounder and an eight pounder that Mexican Army had, just by chance. <laughs> While the Americans had six pound cannon, cannons and they had two 18 pound cannons that weren't meant for the field. They were going to take it to the fort for the siege, but Taylor pulled them up on the road. That to me is what I think kept the Mexican Army from doing a full out infantry charge because now they're getting bombarded because they had. He had 300 wagon trains of ammunition. He had a lot of ammunition. So they could just pop on fire, 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 doing the shrapnel, the spherical case, which explodes and flows out. And then for when they got closer, they had a canister. It was essentially like a big tin can with balls in it, a lot of lead, metal, whatever kind of balls. Yeah. U.S. were, were uh, iron. The Mexican army had lead and, and copper and iron balls in their canister shot. There's a after concert iron. What happens here? It's very salty. Iron corrodes. Copper has a different corrosion process. It's pretty pretty strong. Lead is great, but they all form a patina. Uh, that's because a lot of our a lot of our iron stuff is in really bad shape because it costs money to conserve and then and keep it curate. Uh, that is a, a smaller. Uh, that's a from a canister shot. That ball Mexican canister shot. Okay, that's a copper canister versus copper canister versus iron canister. And see, we're looking at the patterns. We're looking at the patterns of the line. You see that? You see the lines there? Yeah. This is from the end of the day where the U.S. is just bombarding the Mexican army. Because that's it. It started like this. Then at the end, it would go like that. The day after three out of four. And there was a break in the fire because of the corn grass. Even though there was water on the ground, the corn grass caught fire and smoke and so that. And during the break, they kind of shifted all that. Okay, uh, I don't even want to ask what time it is. But and then we can use stuff like surfer to kind of get out where you're using the weight and all that to get to see the patterns or make the patterns uh, stand out for you. Okay, y'all probably just want to see more. Okay, that's an iron canister shot. That's after going through conservation. This was a cool conservation project because when we send the stuff up to Texas A&M for the underwater lab, they do it. <laughs> we get a ball this size, we'd get back like that because they take off all the corrosion and the good part of them was only like that. This was done at SEAC. Okay, the problem is you got to continually conserve it. It takes a lot of treatment. Those other ones, they're good, but it doesn't, it's not, 
This is what we have at Palo Alto is supposed to be a research collection for anybody, for everybody who wants to study the ball. Yeah, this is a much better research tool than a ball that's a fragment of its size. But that's technology, that's shifting, that's, that's everything. Okay, I've always said I, when I learned an undergraduate, the best thing you can do to an archeological site is leave it alone. Because one, technology gets better and you better. Like, okay, y'all seen Next Generation, right? Star Trek? Yeah, data, he goes, yeah, you know, and he gets all the information we can get by digging. But that's okay, that's not that's a TV show, right? Okay, yeah, but look, you can still see similar patterns, right? You still see that in there. I forgot, uh, K shot. Oh, this is K shot. I don't know why. Oh, K shot canister shot. Okay, we still see the patterns at the end of the day. At the end of the day, they're definitely going north south. Oh, shot, yeah, and then you have diff that different graph. This is a different uh software based on the weight we got left weight yeah it's cool um oh yeah <laughs> look at that cannonballs copper versus iron what's one pattern you see here with the copper versus iron well not many okay but where are they at they're north. That's where the U.S. Army was, right? Yeah. So we know the U.S. was not firing any copper cannonballs at that, but we already knew that anyway. But yeah, you could just different things like that. But they were. Um, you know what? I'm gonna tell you this. It's so fucking cool. <laughs> My son, when he was 10 years old, found this copper ball with another kid there. It was nice. It was cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Insignias. There should be so many more of these out on the field. These are collect. This is what collectors do. <laughs> God, it's not even ten. How many people got wounded out there? Okay, there was oh uh, twenty to about two hundred wounded or dead casualties. I mean, some dead. Uh, yeah, it was it was great different because it was artillery. Okay, the Americans carried the day because one the two eighteen pounders. And then two, they had this new strategy of flying artillery. Any of y'all ever heard of that? Who haven't been to Palo Alto? It was developed by Major Samuel Ringgold. Okay, that's what Brownsville got. We got names of things. Ringgold, there's Ringgold Street, is named after Samuel Ringgold. He died from wounds received. Okay, they say the they said that the Mexican shots were ineffective. Well, he, Ringgold didn't think that. <laughs> he got hit. Uh, he got hit with a. He died. Okay, this is the other horror thing. You don't die right away. You don't always die, you know. Ringgold died. This happened on May 8th. I think he died May 9th or May 10th at, at Port Isabel, waiting for that. Page, American soldier, had his mandible blown off. He made it on train. He was trying to get back to Baltimore. He made it on the train somewhere up north of, in between New Orleans and, and Baltimore, alive. God, can you imagine that? I guess they had, what did they have? It wasn't morphine. Was it morphine? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, oh, this makes me hurt right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Coins. <laughs> yeah. Not all of them are, period. A lot of, we found realers there. We definitely found some for soldiers, realers. We found an 1841. This is, okay, this is the road. You can see Trace that. There's an artillery button, and then we found an 1841 U.S. coin. Right. Cool. Dime. Peter Liberty. Buds. There's a difference in Mexico. That's third party. There's a letter in here. A D stands for Dragoon. Okay. <laughs> Military buttons. Also, collector. This is there should be so many more. People wounded and all that. Yeah. yeah so the last thing, third telephone. I always call this the wrong thing. I know what it is. It's a, uh, I always call it a stirrup. It's a, what do you call it? The thing that goes on the back of your boot? Spur. Yeah. Yeah. That's from a U.S. soldier. That, anybody want to harbor a guess? Uh, perfect. That's it. Okay, how did they make commands? Drums and bugles, right? How can you can't hear in a battle, especially with the cannons firing. They use instruments that. Okay, they're in the historic record that Americans were focusing on the, the signal callers. That was cool. Right on the Mexican line, we found this guy, Chuck, who I don't think I have a picture of, although I should. He's cute. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
he found this. He got so excited because yeah, it's it is so cool. Just evident. It, yeah, beautiful. That is out there. Okay, these are from the Mexican, the British brown bears. The English um, would sell their excess weapons that were not. They were third pot. They're made in India. They're pretty crappy, uh, but they would sell them to third world countries. I'm up at this in the early part of the 19th century. British brown bears. The U.S. muskets didn't have that. So it's this different thing, you know. You know what side were you doing? The other cool thing, okay, we had the the musket ball sizes, the calibers were different sizes, right? And I also mentioned they had the 18. We got a pro XRF or SEAC did, and we we it's it's something that shoots an X-ray into that, and we have to clean up a spot and gives you an elemental composition of that. We uh, UTRGV has one; they're using it for some copper study. We use it on any type of thing. I'll tell you what it is, what it's made of. So we're able to separate, not just by size and visual, but through the element, through science, separate the, and it was true. The Mexican all fell into one grouping, the U.S. game, and you want the, the later one from the, from the Fort Brown in the early part of the 20th century, they had their own unique signature too. That's pretty cool. So we can emphatically say these are U.S. or those are Mexican or those are not battle related. It's nice. The things I get excited about. <laughs> okay, what's this, anybody? It's a bullet, right? What kind of bullet? Does that belong at this battle? Right. Who, who said that? I should. I should brought. Oh, Danny. <laughs> I should brought gifts out to give out. Yeah. Uh, yo, it is Civil War. Everywhere there was a road. Chuck, just a chunk. We're gonna find a mini ball. We're gonna find a mini ball. Yeah. Everywhere there was a road, and it was in one of our grids, we found a mini ball. Just, just went. You know why? Because the five years of the Civil War, there were soldiers all around here. Okay, that goes to the next battle. No, it goes to the last battle. I'm sorry. Hell, I got to get out of this battle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is, okay, this is a paleo point. What it's doing on the surface, we saw it visually on the ground. What it was doing, it's a manual part. Somebody, somebody brought it, somebody had it. I don't think it was the late period. I bet it was a collector had it, dropped it. So who knows? Who, we'll, I'll never know, we'll never say. I can make all sorts of guesses. I can write whatever the hell I want, but we'll never know the truth, exactly. Oh wait, I was also taught, don't say truth when you talk about history. Why? There is no truth. We all hold our own truth. It's per, truth is perspective. It's what you see. Um, yeah, tonight, y'all are going to have different truths about my presentation, right? You know, everybody's going to have their own perspective with good, bad, sucked, whatever. It's going to be there. It's, and that's the way. That's why you cannot say truth. Today. We, as archaeologists, try to give the most accurate depiction of the past. That's the best we can do. The most accurate depiction, based upon as much evidence as we can provide, including historic records. Okay, let's get out of there. That is a nose cone for the, the early 20th century I mean, artillery. It's a French 35, something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I should, know, I should be better, but I'm not. Yeah, so these are the end battle lines of the road crappily drawn in there, uh, thanks to me out there. But yeah, that's good. But the Mexican Hospital, all this, the lines through that, there's a lot. There's a cliff, right? We need to get on to that other part. But okay, more importantly, not that we need to do archaeology there. We need to preserve it. I worked for the for the Park Service for 25 years. I believe in that agency because their main mission is to preserve these resources, which the cultural, natural, you know, Yosemite, uh, the shallow battlefield, uh, the French Quarter, these treasures of the United States. The Castillo de San Marcos, that's pretty cool. Y'all never been there in Florida. Where's Barry? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, preserve these treasures unimpaired to the best of our ability for the education, no, for the benefit, education, and enjoyment of current and future generations of the American public. It's an important mission. And it's cool, because that's what we have in the past. Okay, y'all are here, Texas Metro Naturalist. Y'all should appreciate a mission like that. A lot of people in the public don't, but it is cool. Something very, very special, what they're doing. So we can have the Grand Canyon for our kids and our grandkids. So they can go see the geysers at that, which is, oh, it's, yeah, preserving something because there's so many outside changes that change the inside nature. It's all connected, like the hydrology around the battlefield. 
we'll never be able to restore the hydrology, but to keep it an open prairie like the soldiers, which is part of our mission, the soldiers saw, we'd have to use control burning, replant, remove the trees mechanically, use control fire, plant the corn grass where it was removed, and then with, with uh, these tools, we'll able to keep the cosmetic look of the battlefield through vegetation management. Okay, that's it. Let's go on to another battle. We're talking about Palma, May 9th, 1846. I apologize, but I'll take a long time. You see that kind of stylized drawing? Pa, let's go. This is quick. Nothing happened here. Yeah, actually, this was an intense. This was intense. Uh, okay, artillery duel. Palo Alto. At six, before sunrise, Arista decided to take his army six miles down the road to a place where the road crossed a Rosaka, a natural ravine use it as a dense vegetation as a means to negate the effects of the American artillery. It was a good plan. This is what it looks like. Oh, that's it today. I thought I had them. Okay, yeah, here it is. That, it's, up, it's another one. Like, hey, okay, the road, this is pretty much at the same place. And we did do archaeology out there, but, then, but uh, yeah. Uh, but most of the battle took place here. The Mexican army was gone. You can't see the color in this. The Mexican army was on both sides out to here. This is what we own right now. This is 34 acres. And Karen says she's going to do the memorial illumination in November. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Most of the battle was out there. It's lost to development. We did our survey. We did our metal detector survey. We only found one musk ball here, and then we found some reenactor stuff there. So the archaeological integrity is not there. And we had, I had uh, PBS and Jay come out. They did. A shovel test and trench survey to kind of test because uh, I know that land had been it was a polo field and uh, they had re it had been reworked. I wanted to see the amount and yeah, you know, a good part of it was, but we it wasn't reworked enough that we if the battle had taken place and there was fighting here, we would have found the we would have found the artifact. So that's why I had them do some surface testing to see yeah, did we not find any artifact because the metal detectors only go so deep, so they're buried over a foot. You can you know, they'll be buried and not there. Uh, so I'm saying we're pretty confident. Yeah, the, the Mexican soldiers that were here held their ground, but the vegetation was so dense, they didn't see, they were never engaged by the U.S. So they did not get in action. The Americans concentrated, I don't know, I hope they have another battle. The Americans concentrated less. Maybe I have another map. No, I don't. Uh, let me go back. American concentrated, and after two hours of intense fight, this was much more even battle. It was hand-to-hand, -hand, about 200 casualties on each side. Um, and after two hours of intense fighting, the Americans were able to penetrate here and capture the Mexican camp. And so the Mexican army in disorganized route across back the river, and that ended the siege of Fort Brown. Okay, I said, let me go back here. I do this all night. Um, <laughs> this, most of the battle is here. It's not archaeologically important, the battle, but this is what we have left of this site, right? It is the battlefield. It is Mexican sure troops were lined up here. So we can use it. And then in the city, it's safe. You don't want to have big events in Palo Alto. Why? Karen. Rattlesnakes. <laughs> the rattlesnakes and brush and, and Palo Alto, yeah, we keep it wild. And yeah, there's we, we still have to relocate rattlesnakes, although they still do, that sit by the by the visitor center. All that. Yeah. So we can't have big events here. We can have big events like this, Memorial Literature which we started doing around Veterans Day. We did 8,000 luminarios to honor soldiers from both countries that fought in these two battles. It's a way, a gateway to get the public out and aware of what took place here. And I'll say how important that is in there. But those were really cool events. Okay, it leads us to out. As the siege was May 3rd, May 9th, uh, for only two casualties. Well, Four, if you count that, uh, well, who is it? some sergeant got killed, they buried him, he got blown up again by a, a mortar, twice, I think. So, well, yeah. Okay, and then Major Jacob Brown, which they would eventually name the fort after him. Okay, it was a six point earthen star fort, is all that. This place in Mexico. This part was never finished construction, is my belief, based upon uh, the historic record we have. Barbara, Okay, it's out there the fort, blah, 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 artillery range, all that. We know that that's where it is on the poles. The river had shifted down. We don't know if it was gradual or, or, or not, or if it jumped. But that's right. Is that the end of a golf course there? I'm trying to speed up because I got one more battle after this. That's the NHL boundary. But what's cool? 
This is the rock star of the three Mexican War sites. There are standing ruins right there. <laughs> they don't look like a lot to, to maybe y'all, but that is actual 1846 ruins of an earthen fortification. That was so important. It was on the island. I don't know, maybe, uh, uh, yeah, here. Yeah, you want to think, you think their burial's still there? <laughs> you think they're human remains? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, um, that's it, so sorry. Yeah, for it. let me see, let's get close. Okay, that is the last of the cannon. Remember I mentioned them being placed in 1916? That is the only one that's still in its original interment. Placed with a muzzle facing the sky to denote a U.S. soldier gave his life in battle there. That's a fort, this was a driving range, almost threw this again. He's got a bigger remote. Yeah, uh, this is a bastion of fort. Okay, in 2011, I got. I went to the. I went to this training class in 2010 up in North Dakota. It's a park service that Steve the War, who runs it, uh, another another friend and mentor. Um, I can point out people, but I won't. <laughs> don't don't pay attention to that dude. That's not me though. It's Michael Van Wagen, uh, a good friend of mine. Um, we did geophysical. It's a, a archaeological prospecting. It was up there where we use uh, remote sensing equipment. An it's non-invasive equipment to study archaeological sites. Um, out there around the golf course, we worked with Bob Lucio, who was then manager of the golf course. Um, this is ground penetrating radar. We came into this thinking ground penetrating radar was going to carry, uh, was going to give us the most evidence, the best. We were using that as our main tool. That's magnetometer. Let's see. Okay, you can't wear any metal. You can't have zippers. You can't have any metal, any buttons, anything. Your shoes, can't, there can't be no metal on you when you use this. Unless you screw up the data. And then this is electricity. There's Robin again. There's electricity. That dude's from England. I forgot his name. Okay, that was the one. It's because the soil's different. Every, the soil's different. Some metal detectors don't work good in Cameron County. This, the electric resistivity. And they all do something like sending pulses and getting them back and all that. That kind of that kind of scientific stuff that we do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, out there, this turned me, but I'll show you the data. Okay, this is the GPR data. You can kind of see the fort, the thing over there, right? You see. Yeah, this you can see a little stronger here. These are these are utility lines that are out there that I see. Okay, you can look at it a little bit harder. Look, this is the bastion over here. Uh, this is the standing ruins right there, these dots. But that is the electric resistivity. Okay, that was, yeah, it's just different sheet, but you see that point coming out. That's so cool. There, it's just proving the subsurface ticker. And then we did, there was an 18 pound bastion over here that a student from uh, UT Pan American did some GPR and we got marginal results. But I don't even, I don't know if I have that. I probably don't. Anyway, there's possible having Mexican. Uh, batteries on this side of the river because the river shifted. But anyway, I'll just go back one more time and say Fort Brown is out there. Fort Brown, right? I said it was a rock star of the three Mexican war sites because it has standing ruins. Right now, it's in balance. Filimon Vela put out a, a it's, it's all to give it. The I, International Boundary and Water Commission who owns that peninsula want to give it to the Park Service. Uh, right now, it's stalled out from some political bureaucratic crap. Uh, and there's going to be a chance for people to, to comment on the, on the boundary study, whether it should be part of the park. And it needs to be. That is standing ruins from 1846 there. Uh, and I'll say it in a minute. Uh, yeah. During this war, the U.S. Army invaded a, federal, a foreign country for the very first time in Kazakhstan. How many times have we done it since? This is the very first one. I thought that's important. Okay. <laughs> but this is what's important. What started on the fields over here in what now is Brownsville, across from the city of Matamoros, would lead to events and changes that would forever change the face of the North American continent, with Mexico seeing over half of its national territory. Bringing all, you know, my family was here in the 18th century. We became U.S. citizens out there because of. It's huge. How many other people were affected? New Mexico, all that, all that, was, all these places were popular. It is a huge change. And you know what? And it's here. People say Brownsville has a lot of 
important history or this area, this lower Rio Grande Valley. It is, we just need to study it and appreciate it. Not relive it, hopefully. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we go on Civil War. I'll do this really quick. Y'all know we have the last battle of Civil War here. Uh, that's the map of science. Uh, okay, this has a lot of myth. <laughs> Some people say, because there's a lot of dead. No, we did archaeology there. Theodore Barrett. He never had action. He was, okay, the last year and a half of the war, the Federals were confined to Brazos Island. How many, how many of y'all been on Brazos Island? Brazos Island, Brazos Santiago Island. How many of you in the Boca Chica Beach? Okay, y'all been on Brazos Santiago Island. That was it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, they were confined to that. Okay, but like I said, all five years, there were truths from both sides. That's why there are a lot of artifacts out there in Palmyra. We did a study of the core battlefield. I'm skipping ahead of myself. Rip Ford, uh, Ranger, all that. He was a Confederate commander there. There's a quick running go. Okay. As recently as 1997, the Palmetto Ranch battlefield became a designated a National Historic Landmark. Uh, and there's only, there's only like 25 miles. It's a pretty special designation. A National Monument would be a little bit higher. But it's a pretty special designation as far as cultural resource goals and all that. So, you know why? Because it had such strength in integrity and in character and setting. <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. It's out here. Here's the core battlefield. It's there. Boca Chica's changed. I grew up here in Brownsville. Boca Chica's were the place for you. I didn't appreciate the Battle of Palmetto Ranch when I was a kid. Uh, and when I came back here in 2001, because we used to go all over the place out there. Uh, when I came back in 2001, Fish and Wildlife had gotten or had their post up. I find out they're not really owners on a lot of that. The port and all that would lease and that, but they've lost a lot. I said, okay, I can't get access like I used to, but you know what? At least this landform is going to be preserved because it was undeveloped. It was nice. In 97, they made it an NHL because it had such integrity and setting up. You could be out there and see what a Civil War soldier saw in 65. It was that good. It's a coastal prairie. It did flooding. Even with the lack of flooding, it stayed the same because it's so, oh, yeah. It's, I got two more slides. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Okay, we did some, these are archaeologists. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, these are Civil War bullets. Uh, those are not, those are not Civil War, those are, those are Civil War musket balls. That's a button. Um, we did score about. Okay, basically, the evidence that we found out there, that was a state archaeologist. We did, we did several studies over and off. It's never done in a big chunk because you got to need a lot of money. This is that's a state archaeologist. We just did different things where we can a little bit and chew off it. You have to have, you have, to have partners. There's two things. I already said one of them uh, that are definite. If you're going to do something, if you're going to work, you're going to make mistakes. If you do anything, you're going to make a mistake, right? The other thing is you cannot do anything alone. You need partners because different people bring different things to the table. A best project is done with partners. Uh, and Barbara, I'm going to ask you a question. What the hell is that? If you can answer that, we can leave. That's the last slide. <laughs> okay, I found every I know, every Civil War campsite there is. That's a coffee grinder. You don't see the ridges in here because uh, 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 that's anyway, I'll, I'll, that's a yeah okay <laughs> okay yeah. So the evidence shows where the 45th Indiana faced a coming Confederate, which is in the historic record. But it's quick, everybody else left. There was not many casualties. I, uh, lucky of a dozen. Maybe after trying to swim the river, but some of the, the 45th was captured inside uh, inside here. The the second color, the other federal troops got away there. The 45th was captured in there with a the river on that. And, but they didn't all die. It was, it was a small, it was a running battle. It was not that significant as a battle. It didn't make, it was fought a month after, if y'all didn't know, a month after Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. But what's important about that? Lee surrendered the, the Army of Virginia. The Western Confederates were still not surrendered, they say. Anyway, that's a landform. It's changed so much. Uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry to run you over. What time is it? I'm scared to ask. 9.30?
Okay, sorry. I really appreciate your attention. Y'all been a lovely audience. Um, I'll be here every Wednesday.